Hello, and welcome to Session 7 of the Basic Tax Course. We're going to begin Session 7 with a review of the Session 5 Quiz Answer Key. I have up on the screen in front of you now the Session 5 Quiz, and next to it is the Session 5 Quiz Answer Key. As usual, I tend to read more from the quiz than the answer key. You can reference the answer key yourself by printing it uh, from inside the Course Materials page of Session 7 and read along with me as we go. We're going to review the most frequently missed questions from session number five, and we will begin with question number four. Generally, you must begin to receive distributions from your retirement plan the year you reach age 70 and a half, or the year in which you retire, whichever is later. That answer on that question is false. And the reason for that is that the IRS technically says that your required minimum distribution starts on April 1st of the year following the year you reach age 70 and a half. So it isn't the year you reach age 70 and a half. It is April 1st of the year following the year you reach age 70 and a half. So what that means is you have a tax client and you're paying attention to how old he is. Your client is age 70. So in the year that you're preparing his return where he's age 70, you're going to be asking yourself, okay, what is the calendar date on which he reaches age 70 and a half? Is he going to reach age 70 and a half before the end of the current year? So let's say, for example, we're looking at a 2010 tax return. Your client is 70 years old. Is he going to be age 70 and a half by the end of 2010? If he is, then he is required to take a minimum distribution from his uh, IRA beginning in 2011. And it would be by April 1st of 2011. So if during 2010 he turns age 70, and by the end of 2010 he is age 70 and a half or older, then you would be required or he would be required to take his minimum distribution by April 1st of the year following 2010, and that would be 2011. So that's a quick illustration of what the meaning is behind that problem. Number seven. Contributions to a Section 401k plan are considered to be pre-tax contributions to the extent that they are not includable in the employee's income for the year in which they are made. This is a true statement. I'm not sure why students have difficulty with this in terms of this is a most frequently missed question, which means a lot of students answer false when the answer is true. Essentially what happens when you work for an employer and in your employer offers a salary deferral plan to a 401k, when you take money from your wage and insert that or deposit it into your 401k plan, your employer will reduce your wage by the amount you contribute. That is why it is referred to as a pre-tax contribution. They are not includable in the employee's income in the year that they are made. But when you are able to make a pre-tax contribution, you are not considered to have a basis in your plan for that contribution that is pre-tax, which means when you take a distribution later on, the distribution is taxable. And the next question in line for review, a most frequently missed question from the Session 5 quiz, is question number 11. Sandy Lee is single, age 66, and retired. During the year, she received $4,000 of interest income, $5,000 of Social Security income, and $3,000 of pension income. Sandy is required to file a federal return. Well, Session 5 was a session on pension income, and in Session 6, we looked at the taxability of Social Security. But this question is not really about either of those things. It's a filing requirement question, so we've taken you all the way back in time to session number one. And in session number one, we explored the filing requirements for most individuals, and we also learned that if an individual is age 65 or older, they get an additional standard deduction of $1,400 that increases their filing requirement. So in order to determine whether or not Sandy is required to file a return, we need to determine how much her income is and what her filing requirement is. So let's take a look first at the filing requirement. Well, the filing requirement for a single person is their standard deduction, plus their personal exemption. And in the case of Sandy Lee, her standard deduction is 5,800 plus 1,400, and her exemption amount is 3,700. When we add those three numbers together, we get $10,900. Well, is Sandy's income equal to or greater than 10,900? If it is, she's required to file. Well, clearly we have said that the answer to this question is false. That means she is not required to file, and let's see why. 
Firstly, we begin with the income she has that's taxable. We have $4,000 of interest income and $3,000 of pension income. And what about this $5,000 of Social Security income? Well, Social Security income is only taxable when the income is high enough. And in Session 6, we did learn that the base amount for a single filer on the taxability of Social Security benefits is $25,000. No matter which way you cut it, Sandy Lee's income is less than $25,000. What that means is that none of her Social Security benefits are taxable. And since none of her benefits are taxable, they don't even factor into the test for determining her gross income. So her gross income for the year is actually going to be $4,000 of interest and $3,000 of pension. That's a total of $7,000. If her income is less than $10,900, she is not required to file, and her income is less than $10,900. That is why question number 11, the correct answer is B, or false. So that concludes the review of the Session 5 quiz answer key. Now let's take a look at the Session 6 homework assignment. And I have up on the screen in front of you now the Session 6 manual. I'm on page 22 taking a look at the homework assignment. And the homework assignment reads, Fred Flintstone is married to Wilma Flintstone. They are both retired and will be filing married filing joint. Fred and Wilma's Form 1099-R and Social Security statements are attached. Fred also received a Form 1099-INT reporting the following amounts. Box 1 interest of $2,500 and Box 3 interest of $5,000. By this point in the course, those box numbers should mean something to you. Box 1 is ordinary interest. It is fully taxable. Box 3 is U.S. government bond interest. And at the federal level, it is also fully taxable. So we essentially have uh, $7,500 of taxable interest for the Flintstones. And none of the U.S. bond interest was spent on higher education. That simply means that you don't need to worry about figuring or determining whether or not they're going to be entitled to exclude some of that interest income from taxability. They will not be able to. Here is Fred's 1099 SSA for his Social Security. You can see he received $6,000 for the year. He also has a 1099-R showing 18800 of gross distributions from his pension plan, of which 17000 is taxable. It's a distribution code of 7, meaning it's a normal distribution, not subject to a penalty. And you will observe that the IRA box is not checked. That means that this income will be reported on the pension income line of his 1040. Wilma also received Social Security. Her income amount is $3,000. And on her 1099-R, we have $16,000 of gross distribution, all of which is taxable. It's a normal distribution, and again, it is not from an IRA. Therefore, it will be reported as pension income on her federal return. So all in all, the comment I have for you to begin the opening paragraph on the answer key for Session 6 homework is that the Flintstones have a pretty straightforward tax return. This should not have challenged you much. So we're going to just flip over to the finished 1040 return. I was really explaining what to do as we went. The beginning point is, of course, to enter both their names and select the married filing joint filing status, enter two exemptions, and then on line 8A we enter that $7,500 of interest. On line 16A, we enter the gross distributions from the pension plans, and those totaled $34,800 of which the taxable amount is $33,000. On line 20A, we needed to determine how much Social Security benefit to enter on line 20B. 20A, we enter the total amount of Social Security issued, but on line 20B, we need to figure how much of the Social Security is taxable and enter that amount. Well, to do that, we can use the Social Security Benefits Worksheet. So let's go take a look at that worksheet together. So in working on the Flintstones' taxability of their Social Security benefits, it's helpful to use the Social Security Benefits Worksheet. And we begin the worksheet by entering the total benefits received for the year on line one. That's $9,000. We then take that amount and divide it by two, and we get $4,500. The next step is to take half of the benefits, add them to all of the other income for the year, and total that. And when you do that, you get $45,000. Now we compare $45,000 to the base amount for their filing status. Married Filing Joint has a base amount of $32,000. We will enter $32,000 on line 9, and then we subtract line 9 from line 8 to get $13,000. Now it just happens to be the case that 
If the amount you enter on line 10 is less than the next number for a base amount, which is 12,000, you simply take the number on line 10 and divide it by two and you've got the taxable benefits. But if the amount on line 10 is greater than the amount on line 11, now the equation gets a little more complicated. And the first thing that they have you do is look at the difference between line 10 and 11, and in this case, that's $1,000. We then take line 11 and divide that by two and we get 6,000. We then take 85% of 1,000 and enter that on line 16, and then we enter on line 15 the amount from line 2. The formula simply says take the amount on line 2 and add that to 85% of the amount on line 12. And when you do that, you get 5350. The next step is to see is the amount on line 17 greater than or less than 85% of the amount on line 1. And 85% of the amount on line 1 is 7650. Line 17 is clearly less than that, so on line 19 we enter the lesser number, 5350, and that is the amount of taxable benefits that the Flintstones had. So we go back up to their 1040 form and enter the 5350. The next step is to add up their income. Their adjusted gross income is 45,850. On line 40 we enter their standard deduction, and in this case their standard deduction is going to be the amount that you see for married filing joint plus the additional standard deduction because each of the filers is age 65 or older, but we go with the additional standard deduction for being married, and that is, of course, less than 1400 It is only 1150 So we're going to go 11600 plus 1150 plus 1150 and that gives us $13,900. We subtract 13900 from 45850 and we get 31950 Next, we take their personal exemption amount. That's 2 times 3700 $7,400, we subtract that out, and we get taxable income of $24,550. The tax tables give us tax of $2,836. They're withholding a $1,600, and so the Flintstones are going to owe $1,236 for the year. Now, their interest income did exceed $1,500. They are required to attach Schedule B to their return. I've entered uh, the required information onto the Schedule B, and I did want to point out that the bottom of Schedule B does have the mandatory checkboxes and in every case we answered no uh, for the Flintstones. So that concludes the review of the Session 6 homework assignment. It is now time to push pause on video playback and take the Session 6 quiz. When you are finished completing the Session 6 quiz, resume video playback for the Session 7 lecture. Welcome to Adjustments to Income. At the beginning of the student manual, you will see the course content, the topics that we're going to be covering today. And essentially, we're covering our topics in the order that they appear on the Form 1040. It's handy to have a Form 1040 printed in next to you while I'm teaching. And I see in the classroom we don't have any 1040s, but we'll be getting those to you. <laughs> just so that when I say, hey, this goes on that line, it's just nice to be able to look at it. You'll also see that there's a reading assignment associated with today's class. And the reading assignment is optional. Now if you are a really super 100% dedicated tax preparer who wants to be the best that you can be, the best of the best, then of course you would read all of these and you'd spend time studying them. You would also complete every assignment we give you because you'd really, really want to get a grasp on all of the topics that we're covering. Now some people are not interested at all in that level of work and there's no requirement that you give that level of work, but we provide all of these resources to you to help you understand where the material that comes into my manual came from, and also to help clarify issues. So if after class you think, gee, that was interesting, but I don't quite get it, maybe you can go to the IRS publication and read more about it, get a better grasp of it. So I'm on to now what would be page two of the manual. We're on to the introductory paragraph, which says adjustments to income form 1040 lines 23 through 36. Commonly referred to as above the line deductions, Adjustments to income allow you to deduct certain expenses from your gross income without the requirement of reporting them on Schedule A. Now, the next paragraph says that in recent years, the number of deductions available as adjustments to income has increased because Congress and Presidents Clinton and Bush have pushed to make certain deductions available to a greater number of filers. Now, of course, Bush and Clinton have been out of office for quite a while now. We've had Obama. And really, in the time we've had Obama, there have been no new adjustment items added. So all of the adjustments that we see uh, on the Form 1040 have been here for at least the last four years. 
well, actually longer because most of them came in early in Bush's administration. So they've been around for quite a while, but a number of them are set to expire. Two of them are set to expire as of 2011, being the last year, and some others will, are set to expire at the end of 2012. So heading into the 2013 tax season where we will be preparing 2012 returns, we're going to need to be paying attention to the fact that unless Congress extends a couple of these adjustment items again, they will be gone. And uh, unless Congress extends other adjustment items, they will be gone after 2012. So politically, it's going to be an interesting year. We, of course, it's an election year, and politicians are going to be up there talking about stuff. Election years are typically years where not much happens legislation-wise. There's just lots of talk, but not much action. So uh, it, it's going to be a curious year to see what they say and what they're trying to extend out and so forth. We're going to be taking the course today in the order that the items or adjustments appear on Form 1040. And right here, you just see a cutout of Form 1040. We're looking only at the adjustments section. And you will see that the very first item in line is educator expenses, followed by certain business expenses of reservists, then on to health savings accounts and so forth. And session seven, password number one is HOOD, H-O-O-D. So just moving on in the manual, the next item or the first topic of the day is going to be educator expenses, line 23. And this is an above-the-line deduction for certain expenses of elementary and secondary school teachers. It was set to expire at the end of 2009, and it was extended for two years as a result of the Reed-McConnell Tax Relief Act. So two years from 2009 means that the expiration year is actually 2011. So unless this particular provision is extended, it will not be available to teachers when we prepare tax returns for them next year. 2011 is technically the last year. So let's look at the rules for it, though. If a person is a teacher, are they allowed to claim the deduction? And of course, how much is the deduction? As with all things that I've noticed in tax law, there are misconceptions about certain line deductions. One of the misconceptions I frequently see is that because Schedule A says, if your deductions for non-cash charity were more than 500, you need to fill out this form, many tax preparers and taxpayers assume that you don't need anything at all other than to put 500 on that line that, you know, oh, their line says you need a form if it went over 500, so we'll just put 500 without even asking the client if they actually had the expense. And I see this frequently with educator expenses. I'll have a teacher come to me. They did their own return the year before, or they went to another tax professional the year before, and they say, well, uh, isn't it just 250? Don't I automatically get that? And the answer is no. <laughs> you actually have to have paid the expense. You have to have paid the right kind of expense, and you have to have a documented receipt for the expense. And it seems a little bit trivial. After all, we're only talking about $250. However, in the world of tax preparation, we are supposed to be precise. So either the client has or does not have proof of that particular expense. If they have proof of educator expenses, the maximum deduction they can claim as an above the line deduction on line 23 would be $250. Now, I have uh, school teachers that I work with who manage consistently every year to spend less than that. And they're very honest about it. They'll say, yeah, well, you know, the I've got a really great PTA in our school. They do all the fundraising. I just really have to spend nothing. And then I have other teachers who say, I refuse to spend anything. Not one penny am I spending on that classroom. And then I have other teachers who literally spend thousands. And so if you have a teacher that has spent more than $250, and it's an ordinary and necessary expense of their business, which would be teaching, uh, then the excess amount can, of course, be claimed as a miscellaneous itemized deduction on Schedule A. Uh, and if it inc includes meals, travel, or entertainment, then you would have to attach a Form 2106. But if it's just classroom supplies that are above and beyond the 250, that can be a line item written right on the Schedule A under employee business expenses. So if you are a teacher, do you qualify to claim the deduction? Well, let's see. Firstly, you have to be an eligible educator. And an eligible educator must meet the following requirements. Number one, work with the kindergarten through grade 12 students as a teacher, instructor, counselor, principal, or aide. So essentially, we're looking at someone who is working K through 12 in a school full time or close to full time. 
and they're saying at least 900 hours during the year, so that's even part-time is enough. But they're looking for someone who is at that level of education, certainly not in preschool and certainly not at the college level. You have to work at least 900 hours during a school year in a school that provides elementary or secondary education as determined under state law. And that would include private schools. If you happen to have a teacher who works for a private school, that's fine as long, of, co of course, as they're teaching K through 12. The deduction is not available to homeschool teachers, however. Qualified expenses include unreimbursed expenses that the teacher paid for books, supplies, other than non-athletic supplies for courses of instruction in health or physical education, computer equipment including related software and service, and other equipment and supplementary materials used by the educator in the classroom. And this question on supplies here is a little confusing. What it's essentially saying is if you are a phys ed teacher, you have to spend the money on phys ed supplies. <laughs> and if you're not a phys ed teacher, then you would spend it on classroom supplies. It's just confusing wording, but that's what it means. The next item in line is certain expenses of reservists, performing artists, and fee-based government officials, line 24. And the first one we're going to look at is performing artists. Now the line itself, if we go back up a couple pages here and look at the adjustments to income line, line 24, this is a relatively new line on the farm, uh, but only the reservist deduction is the newer deduction. The other deductions have been here for a long time, that is the fee-based government officials and performing artists. Those two items have been on available as, item, as line item adjustments for many, many years. But it was about, I would say, six, seven years ago that we saw an actual line added that they could take advantage of. So performing artists is not a new deduction, but it's a deduction that I think I have been able to claim zero times in 20 years. So let's see why. <laughs> <laughs> it is not adjusted for inflation, which could be a good reason for it. Certain performing artists can claim their qualified employee business and educational expenses as an adjustment to income rather than as an itemized deduction. To qualify, all of the following must apply. During the year, you perform services for two or more employers. Well, that's not hard. You are paid at least $200 by each, by two or more employers. Okay. Your related performing arts expenses are more than 10% of your income from performances of those services. All right. And then your AGI is not more than 16000 before deducting these business expenses. Well, this is, of course, where we just get stuck, because this is a deduction clearly reserved for starving artists only. And uh, <laughs> anyone who actually manages to make a living at it would never be eligible for this deduction. How do you claim the deduction if you do happen to have a performing artist who qualifies for it? Well, you enter the deduction on line 24 and attach form 2106 or 2106EZ to describe the expenses being claimed. The next item is a fee basis government official. Fee basis officials are persons who are employed by a state or local government and who are paid in whole or in part on a fee basis and they deduct their business expenses in performance of that job as an adjustment to income rather than as an itemized deduction. So if you happen to have a fee basis government official, you're going to attach form 2106 or 2106EZ, describe the expenses on the form, attach it to the return. But rather than claim the deduction on Schedule A, you will claim the deduction on line 24 as an adjustment to income. Here's the bigger one, the more common one. The line was added when this deduction came to life. <coughs> In the universe of adjustments to income, it's a relatively new one. It's the deduction for overnight travel expenses of National Guard and Reserve members. It's got some pretty precise rules, so it's important to know them. Reservists who stay overnight away from home, more than 100 miles from home, while in service, like for example, for a drill meeting or going away for their two-week reserve camps, may claim an above-the-line deduction for the following unreimbursed travel expenses, transportation, meals, and lodging. The deduction is limited to the rates for such expenses authorized for federal employees, including per diem in lieu of subsistence. And what they're referring to there is if you're driving your car, you can claim the standard mileage rate, and if you're claiming meal expenses, you can claim the per diem rate for meal rather than actually keeping receipts. The per diem rate is really quite generous, and in terms of how to 
determine whether an expense is deductible or not as a uh, miscellaneous itemized deduction on Form 2106. We will cover that in our session on itemized deductions. And actually, on Thursday, we have our first session on itemized deduction. And then next Tuesday, a week from today, we have another session on itemized deductions. And in next Tuesday's session, we will go quite a bit into the types of deductions that can be claimed and how you enter them on Form 2106. So aside from explaining how Form 2106 is completed and how to attach it to your return, which will be covered in another session, what you need to know is if you are dealing with a reservist or a National Guard member who travels more than 100 miles away from home to attend drill meetings or weekend camps, or yeah, weekend drills or the two-week camps or for longer periods of time as well, um, those expenses associated with travel are above the line eligible. Now, you have to be careful because not all reservists have only travel expenses. Most reservists will have travel and other things, like, for example, uniforms. And if they have expenses other than travel, the expenses other than travel still go on Schedule A. So when you're completing Form 2106, for the reservist, you have to divide expenses between those expenses that will carry to the front of the return and be entered as an above the line deduction and those expenses that will go to Schedule A. And the next topic is health savings accounts. This is the larger one. We're going to spend more time on it. Health savings account deductions are claimed on line 25 of 1040 as an above the line deduction. The main thing I encounter with health savings accounts is a lot of people have them but are not necessarily deducting them as adjustments to income. If you receive a W-2 from your employer with a code W in box 12, that code W represents contributions to a health savings account. It means that either the employer or you contributed to your health savings account, but either way it's already been deducted as a pre-tax item. So in order to claim a deduction for health savings account contributions on line 25 of your Form 1040, you need to be able to show that this was after-tax dollars that were contributed. And the fact that there is a code W on a W-2 is indicative of the fact that you probably can't claim the deduction. So it doesn't mean that you can't. It could be that there was employer contributions with a code W and that the employee above and beyond put more in than that. But the code W should be triggering you, hey, there is a health savings account, there was an employer contribution, or there was an employee pre-tax contribution. Is there anything above and beyond that? That would be the question that I would be asking. But because health savings accounts are something that started off with no one having them, but now I see them all the time, I feel it's important to spend a little bit of time learning more about them, the rules for them, who can set them up, when a contribution is deductible, and what happens if you take distributions that you shouldn't be taking. So we're going to study this one a little bit. Now, in order to open up a health savings account, you have to be an individual who is covered only by a high deductible health insurance plan. And if you have only a high deductible health insurance plan, you can open an HSA and contribute money to it. Amounts that are inside the HSA are allowed to grow tax-free. And distributions you take from the HSA are also tax-free, provided they are used to pay qualified medical expenses of the account beneficiary or the beneficiary's spouse or dependents. So what is an HSA? Well, an HSA is a tax-exempt trust or custodial account established exclusively for the purpose of paying qualified medical expenses of the account beneficiary who for the months for which contributions are made to an HSA is covered only by a high deductible plan. So what this is saying is you can have an HSA, you can open it as long as you're qualified. Even after it's open, you're only allowed to make contributions for a month where you do not have any other form of health insurance that is not a high deductible type of health insurance. If you meet those tests, you can contribute money to the HSA. So who is eligible to establish an HSA? Well, HSAs are actually pretty easy to set up. Most health insurance companies have them, and if you're applying for health insurance, one, of the, one or more of the health insurance policy plans available through most health insurance companies will be an HSA. You may elect to participate in the HSA uh, and automatically have the HSA created, created for you by the health insurance company as a part of having that particular policy, or you could simply, on your own, purchase health insurance that is high, high deductible health insurance. 
And if you've done that, then you could independently on your own go off and open up an HSA account. So you're not forced to use the HSA plan in place with your health insurance company. You could purchase health insurance straight out from them and then go off on your own and open up an HSA. HSAs can be set up with a bank, an insurance company, or anyone already approved by the IRS to be a trustee of an IRA or an Archer MSA. No permission or authorization from the IRS is required to set up an HSA. <clears throat> you can just go do it. You must be an eligible individual to establish an HSA, and an eligible individual is any individual who in any month is covered under a high deductible health plan, or HDHP, on the first day of that month and is not also covered by any other plan that is not an HDHP, with the exception of certain plans that provide only limited types of coverage. And the example that leaps to my mind when I look at this is AFLAC. So you could have AFLAC as a supplementary type health insurance uh, that would not interfere with this. Must not also be enrolled in Medicare. And this generally means you are not yet age 65. Once you hit age 65, you're automatically entitled to Medicare in most cases, and therefore you could not be making contributions to an HSA. And you cannot be claimed as a dependent on another person's tax return. So what is an HDHP? Well, generally an HDHP is a health plan that satisfies certain requirements with respect to deductibles and out-of-pocket expenses. That means in order to be an HDHP, you have to have the deductible limits at least within the parameters we're seeing here. And for 2011, these amounts are, if you are an individual, that the HDHP has an annual out-of-pocket deductible of at least $1,200 and maximum expenses to be paid by the individual cannot exceed $5,950. For families, an HDHP must have an annual deductible of at least $2,400 and annual out-of-pocket expenses required to be paid by the family do not exceed $11,900. For family coverage, a plan is an HDHP only if coverage is not provided to any family member under the plan until that family deductible of $2,400 has been met. Now, having said that, if your plan is a high deductible plan but does have preventative care coverage with no deductible at all or a very low copay, that's okay. And of course, Kaiser and a number of other insurance companies have those types of plans where the deductible is quite high. It can be $5,000, $7,500 of deductible for a family easily, um, but all of the preventative care is either free or has a very low deductible. And if that's the case, that's okay. So a plan does not fail to qualify as an HDHP merely because it does not have a deductible or it has a very small deductible for preventative care. However, except for preventative care, a plan may not provide benefits for any year until the deductible for that year is met. And here is an example of a plan that is not a qualifying HDHP. Plan A provides coverage for Jack and his family. The plan provides for the payment of covered medical expenses of any member of Jack's family if the member has incurred covered medical expenses during the year in excess of $1,500, even if the family has not incurred covered medical expenses in excess of $2,400. Thus, if Jack incurred covered medical expenses of $2,000 in a year for himself, then the plan would pay $500 to him. The plan would not cover anyone else in his family until that family member had reached $1,500. But he himself would be covered after he had spent $1,500 on himself. That does not meet the definition of a high deductible health insurance plan because no one can receive any payout at all until $2,400 has been spent. Since the benefits are potentially available under Plan A, even if the family's covered expenses do not exceed $2,400, that plan is not a qualifying HDHP. Now here is another example where we have a plan that is a qualifying HDHP. Same facts as before, except that Plan A now has a $5,000 family deductible and provides payments for covered medical expenses if any member of Jack's family has incurred covered medical expenses during the year in excess of $2,400. That plan now satisfies the requirements for an HDHP with respect to deductibles. So how much can you put into an HDHP? So let's think of an HDHP as like a savings account. That's why it's called health savings account. It's like a bank account. And the bank account is open for the sole purpose of saving for when you need money for when you have to pay for medical. 
So you open up the account and you deposit money in there. And when you make a deposit of money in there, you have to be eligible to participate in the plan because you are covered only by an HDHP. And when you put the money into that account, you can take a deduction for it. You can either take a pre-tax deduction on your W-2 where your employer withholds it from your pay, or you can claim a deduction on the front of your tax return. So of course, then the next question that bodes is, is there any limit to how much I can put in there in a particular year? And the answer is, yes, there is. For self-only coverage, the maximum amount you can contribute if you are under age 55 is $3,050. And if you are age 55 or older, there's a $1,000 catch-up amount of, that would take it to $4,050. Now, if you have a family plan and you are under age 55, you can contribute $6,150. And if you are age 55 or older, you can contribute 7150. And you'll see a little asterisk here which says if both spouses are age 55 or older, then there's an additional $1,000 that would take it to 8150. So it's a rather interesting concept. You could have a health insurance plan with a reasonably high deductible, say, of 5000 for the family in a year. And if you have a family, you can contribute 6150. So theoretically, you could just have the HDHP available there with a minimal balance in it to meet the requirements of who the, ever the administrator is and not really put money in there until you need to have it in there and then contribute it and then pull it out again and spend it. And that would allow you to claim that above the line deduction. So for, for me, that it would be a very sensible way to do it because you can see someone may not want to be contributing money to this HDHP planning for a future when they might possibly get sick. <laughs> Most of us don't think that way, that, uh, saving money in HDP, HP for when we're going to get sick at some point in the future. So the reality is you can kind of figure out what your balance is for your health insurance needs. And if you go to the doctor and you find out you're going to need a procedure and the procedure is going to be expensive, or you just opt, opt to take a particular procedure that's going to be fairly spendy, have a fairly high deductible, and put you there, then that would be an opportunity to put the money into the HDHP for the sole purpose of then taking it out again. It could go in and be in there only for a short period of time. So that's one way of managing it. Now, the limits that you see here on how much you can put into your HDHP are reduced by any amounts that were contributed to an Archer MSA or employer contributions that were made to the HSA and excluded from your income or transfers from an, IRA, uh, an individual's IRA to the HSA. So it is possible to fund your HSA with money that's in another kind of IRA you transferred over. And if either spouse has family coverage, both spouses are treated as having family coverage with the lower annual deductible of the two health plans. And what that's saying is if both spouses have HDHPs and one of those happens to be a family plan, then they're both treated as having family coverage. So how do you claim the, the deduction for the HSA contributions? Well, the simple part is writing the number on line 25. The harder part is figuring out what the number is. And to do that, <laughs> you need to complete form 8889. It seemed to me that there were a whole bunch of forms that start with the letter or the digit 8 that came into being under Bush. There are all kinds of forms. They all start with 8s now. And this one's an easy one, 8889. Well, who has to file the 8889? Well, of course, you file Form 8889 when you want to claim a deduction for a contribution you made, but you also uh, file the form anytime you take a distribution. So you file Form 8889 if any of the following apply. You or someone on your behalf, including your employer, made contributions for 2011 into your HSA, or you received an HSA distribution during the year or you inquired an interest in an HSA because of the death of the account beneficiary. And if that is the case, then you should refer to the instructions on page 2 for Form 8889. You must include certain amounts in income because you failed to be an eligible individual during the testing period. So in other words, you put money into the HDHP, uh, but, or, or you put money into the HSA when you weren't entitled to, uh, there's punishment for that. One of them is you fill out the form and deal with the consequences. Reporting contributions and distributions from HSAs. So I have the form up in front of you now. And I've just given you kind of a nutshell. There are more reasons than this why you need to fill out uh, Form 8889. But the key ones that we're concerned with as tax preparers uh, are that someone put money in or they took money out. And so we're going to use this form to report contributions figure the contribution limit and the allowable deduction for amounts that are contributed. We're going to also use it to 
report distributions and whether any portion of those distributions is taxable. And it's also used to figure the amount of taxable income and or penalty that is attributable to a non-qualifying distribution. When you look at Part 1, you use Part 1 to figure your HSA deductions any excess contributions you made or those that were made on your behalf, and any excess contributions that might have been made by your employer. And you can see right up on line one it says check the box to indicate whether it's a self-only policy or a family policy. And then on line two it says HSA contributions you made for 2011 or those that were made on your behalf. But when you go down the form a little, it also has line nine where it says employer contributions made to your HSA. If you received a W-2 with a box 12 code W, the amount that appears in that box with the code W carries to line 9. That's where you're supposed to put it. And finally, after you've finished filling out part 1, you'll get to line 13 where you figure your HSA deduction. And you will enter the smaller of line 2 or line 12 and carry the total to 1040 line 25. There is a caution here which says if line 2 is more than line 13, you may have to pay an additional tax, and that would be because you put more in than you were allowed to. Part two of the form is used to report distributions from your HSA, and you enter your total distributions that you received during the year on line 14, and then on line 15, you enter your unreimbursed qualified medical expenses. Now, the funny thing with computer software is when a tax preparer gets a tax document like a 1099 HSA, it triggers, oh, I need to put this somewhere in my computer software. So you start looking through the screens and you enter it. But there has to be more thinking behind it than that. The software will treat that distribution on the 1099 HSA as income, included in income, and possibly subject that client to a penalty unless you enter physically, manually, what the qualifying expenses were. So as a preparer, you need to know where those qualifying sh expenses should appear on the form and look at the form to make sure that they are there and that they are there in the right amount. And of course, the amount is entered on line 14. The distributions are entered on line 14 and the unreimbursed expenses are entered on line 15. And clearly, the unreimbursed expenses need to be equal to or greater than line 14. If they are less than line 14, you're going to have income and possibly a penalty. The penalty for taking too much out of your HSA or more out of your HSA than you spend on qualifying medical expenses is 20%. So it's a pretty nasty penalty. It's up from 10% in 2010. Now what happens if you are an S corporation shareholder or a partner in a partnership? If you are an owner or an officer with a greater than 2% share of a subchapter S corporation, you cannot make pre-tax contributions to your HSA through the company by salary reduction. In addition, any contributions made to the HSA by the corporation are taxable as income to that shareholder. However, S corporation shareholders can make their own personal contributions to their HSAs and then take the above line deduction on their personal tax return. Well, we have an entire class that will be teaching right at the end of June, right around June 28, on S corporations. And in that class, we really do get into quite a bit of detail on how you determine whether or not a shareholder has qualifying medical insurance that can be claimed as a deduction by the corporation. When the corporation claims a deduction for health insurance paid for an owner, it is deducted as a payroll expense. In other words, it's treated as a payroll benefit to that shareholder. So the same is true of HSAs. If the corporation made a contribution to the HSA of the shareholder, that sh it's going to be treated as taxable income to that shareholder. It's going to be growth up on the W-2. And then the deduction will actually claim, or the deduction is claimed by the corporation as payroll expense. On the flip side, the shareholder now reports that income as wage income on line 7 of the 1040. And if the shareholder has qualifying medical insurance expense, then they're able to claim a self-employed health insurance deduction. And if that shareholder has qualifying contributions that are a part of that wage income that were to their HSA, then they would claim an HSA deduction. So if it's a little bit making you dizzy hearing about that, then the place I'll really show you how it's done is in our class called Introduction to S-Corporations and LLCs. Partnerships have the same general rule. Partners in a partnership or LLC cannot make pre-tax contributions to their HSA through the partnership by a guaranteed payment reduction. What that means is when you are a partner performing services for your partnership, that partnership will pay you through something called a guaranteed payment. 
technically that's how it's supposed to be done. Guaranteed payments are identified on the K-1. There's a line that says guaranteed payments. Now, if the partnership paid health insurance for a partner, that health insurance is treated as a guaranteed payment, and that health insurance will also be identified with a specific code on the K-1 to help you identify that health insurance is paid for that partner. The same uh, thinking is going into the HSA, except the IRS is saying that the partnership cannot make an HSA payment and then treat it as if it was paying health insurance. That's not what it wants you to do. It's basically going to be a guaranteed payment to that partner. The partner, in their own right, is going to have to establish that they qualify to make contributions to the HSA. And if they can prove that, then the partner, him or herself, claims the HSA deduction on their tax return. So what all of this means is you will not see a shareholder in an S corporation or a partner in a partnership receiving a W-2 that has a code W in box 12. It can't happen. So these are the specific types of individuals where the HSA deduction should be a certainty if that's the kind of plan that they have, and they made contributions to it. Distributions from HSAs, well, they are reported on a 1099 HSA, and I inserted this 2012 document for you. We're teaching 2011 law, but I figured you could adapt to a 2012 document. So this is what will be issued when we're filing tax returns next year. An HSA or Archer MSA distribution is not taxable if you used it to pay qualified medical expenses of the account holder or you rolled it over. An HSA may be rolled over into another HSA. An Archer MSA may be rolled over into another Archer MSA or an HSA. There's also called something called an MAMSA. And it is not taxable if you used it to pay qualified medical expenses, but it doesn't allow for rollovers. We're not going to get into these Archer MSAs or the MAMSAs. There's just too small a group of people that they apply to. But they are out there, and they interrelate in terms of limits, contribution limits, and so forth with the HSAs. Distributions from HSAs are reported on the document you see down here, the 1099 SA. So if your client comes in with a 1099 SA, it should trigger in your mind that you have to complete Form 8889. That's what it means. I have to complete 8889 because there was a distribution or there was a rollover. Either way, I need to address this. If you ignore the form and do nothing, then the IRS will send your client a letter, and your client won't be happy when they get it. There's also something called a deemed distribution from an HSA. You should be careful to follow all the rules that apply to HSAs, or you may be required to report income and or pay a penalty if you make a non-qualifying contribution or take a disqualifying distribution from your HSA. And the following two situations can result in deemed taxable distributions from your HSA. There's actually more than two situations. If you go and read Section 4975, it lists certain prohibited transactions. And if your client engages in a prohibited transaction with respect to their HSA at any time during the year, the account ceases to be an HSA as of the first of the year, and you have to include the fair market value of all of the assets in the account on Form 8889, Line 14A. And essentially, prohibited transactions include things, what would be an example? You use it to secure a loan. Well, that's one that's actually listed here. You use it to, you sell property to your HSA. There's trustee involvement that's inappropriate. You have to really read 4975. It was too much. I didn't want to include it. Um, but the bigger one, the more common one I already mentioned, is if you use any portion of any of your HSAs as security for a loan at any time in 2011. And there could be temptation to do that. After all, every time we buy a house or take out a loan for our business, they're asking for a list of all of our assets. And they might be asking that some of those assets be used as collateral for the loan. Well, IRAs cannot be used as collateral for a loan, and neither can HSAs. Any deemed distribution will be, not be treated as used to pay for qualified medical expenses, and generally these distributions are subject to the additional 20% tax. Now, are there any exceptions to the 20% tax? In other words, I took money out. I did not spend it on medical. Is there an exception to that 20% penalty? Yes, there is. You do not need to pay the penalty on non-qualifying distributions if the beneficiary dies, becomes disabled, or turns 65. If any of these exceptions apply to any of the distributions included on line 16 of Form 8089, check line 17A, and on 17B only, enter on line 17B only, 20% of any amount included on line 16 that does not meet the exception. 
The next item in line is moving expenses. Moving expenses is one of the deductions that's been around for a long, long time. It is an adjustment to income. And there are people who may be able to remember when it used to be something you claimed on Schedule A. Is there anyone in my audience today that remembers when moving expenses were deducted on Schedule A? Well, good things and bad things happened when moving expenses were moved uh, to the front of the tax return as an above the line deduction. Well, the, the good thing was more people could take advantage of the deduction. You didn't have to itemize, and that means you don't have to beat your standard deduction. You don't have to replace your standard deduction with expenses because you moved. You just move and you get to claim those expenses if you have a qualifying move and qualifying expenses. But what happened when they took them off Schedule A is they dramatically reduced the types of expenses that can qualify. So in the olden days, you used to be able to claim a lot more different types of expenses. And in the modern days, there's actually a very limited number of expenses you can claim. People used to be able to claim house hunting and temporary living expenses, and employers got in the habit of reimbursing employees for those things. And then the law changed, and it went to an above-the-line deduction where you can't claim house hunting, you can't claim temporary living. But many employees still expect those benefits, and so employers may give them to them. But if an employer gives a benefit of that kind to an employee, it is not a non-taxable benefit. It is a taxable fringe benefit that will be added up on their W-2. So we're going to take a look at that as well. Now, moving expenses. Who can claim it? You may be able to claim a deduction for job-related moving expenses, and that's a key point. You have to be moving because of a job or to get a job. You can move without having a job waiting for you, but when you move to your new home, you eventually have to get a job, and you have to get a job pretty quick. So. The job doesn't have to be waiting for you. You could move to a new city because you're hoping to find a job when you get there. That would be all right. <clears throat> and then you, however, must find a job. So if eligible to claim moving expenses, you do need to uh, complete Form 3903. And then you figure your allowable deduction and enter it on line 26 of Form 1040. What are the requirements? Moving expenses may be deductible if they are associated with moving to a new home where you have a job and meet certain other tests. Generally, you must begin work at a new job location within one year of the date of your move. So you have up to a year to get a job. Generally, you must meet the time test. <clears throat> Employees must work full time at least 39 weeks during the first 12 months. But if you are self-employed, you must work full time at least 39 weeks during the first 12 months and 78 weeks during the first 24 months. So self-employed people really have to show two years of continuous employment. Generally, you must also meet the distance test. Your new main job location must be at least 50 miles farther from your former home than your old main job was from your former home. If you go to work for the first time, your new job must be at least 50 miles from your old home. Now, this distance test is confusing. And the IRS has a chart down at the bottom here to show you how that works. This is the distance test. You look at your former home and how far you used to drive to your old job. That's three miles. Then it looks at another possible location, a new main job, which is 38 miles from your current home. If you move those 38 miles to be closer to that new job, those mi that expense will not qualify because you didn't move more than 50 miles closer to your new job. You only moved 38 miles closer to your new job, right? And they need to see 50. And it isn't even 50 from the old job to the new job. You have your old commute that was 3 miles, and the new commute would have to be at least 53 miles to be 50 miles further than your old commute is. So we're really comparing commute distances. That's what you're looking at. So then we have another illustration here which says, OK, the new job is 58 miles from my home. My old job was three miles from my home, so if I move within, 50, or within five miles of my new job, I will be more than 50 miles closer. Then my expense qualifies. Now, if this is the first job I've ever had and I move because of it, IRS says that's OK as long as you move more than 50 miles. Exceptions to the time test. You do not have to meet the particular time test that we just discussed. 
if any of the following situations apply. And the most prominent one is the armed forces. If you are in the armed forces and you move because of a permanent change of duty station, then the time test does not apply. Also, if you retire, if you move to the United States because you retired, the time test does not apply. Now, it's not saying that you can claim moving expenses because you retired. It's saying you moved out of the country or you had a move expense related to a job outside of the United States, and then after you moved because of that job, you then retired. Those moving expenses to the job are allowed, but after you retire and move back to America, that's not what is being allowed, it's the job that you acquired. And if you moved for a job, you can claim the expenses associated with the move to that new job. After you acquire that job, you then retire, you can still claim the moving expenses associated with that job but it's not telling you you can claim the expenses associated with moving back to the United States. Survivors, you are the survivor of a person whose main job at the time of death was outside of the United States. Death or disability, your job at the new work location ends because of death or disability. So you move to a job and then you die. <laughs> okay, uh, you will not have to repay the deduction you claim for your moving expenses. Or if you have not yet filed and you're filing the tax return for the decedent, the decedent would be allowed those expenses even though he didn't meet the 39 week out of one year test because he died. Same thing for disability. Now the next one could be one that would easily come up fairly often, transferred or laid off by an employer. You are transferred for your employer's benefit or laid off for a reason other than willful misconduct. You must have obtained full-time employment and expected to meet the test at the time you started the job. So you took a job, you expected to be able to meet the time test when you took that job, so you then claim your moving expenses. And then after you've been working at your job through no fault of your own, you get laid off. The IRS says you can still keep the deduction for those moving expenses even though you didn't meet the time test because you were laid off and it was not for willful misconduct. And session seven, password number two is bachelor, B-A-C-H-E-L-O-R. Okay, so we've looked at the two tests that are associated with a move. Now what is deductible? If you meet those two tests, you can claim moving expenses, including moving your household goods and personal effects, including in transit or foreign move storage expenses, and traveling, including lodging, but not meals, to your new home. Well, there's essentially two different categories here, moving your household goods and personal effects and moving yourself and your family. And 3903 is divided into those two categories. So it essentially says, what were your travel expenses? Put those on one line. What were your moving expenses? And put those on another line. So let's look at what allowable costs of moving your household goods includes. It includes packing, creating, and transporting household goods and personal effects of yourself and members of your household from your old home to your new home, and storing and ensuring household goods and personal effects within any period of 30 consecutive days after the day your things are moved from your home or former home and before they are delivered to your new home. So you pack up all of your stuff and put it on a moving truck, and that moving truck delivers it to the new city where you've moved to but your new house isn't ready yet, so the stuff goes into storage. The first 30 days of storage are allowed. If it's in storage for two months, three months, while well, you're getting your new house put together, or waiting for it to finish being built, or waiting for the loan to close, you're not going to be able to get that extra time. It's only the first month. The cost of connecting or disconnecting utilities required because you are moving your household goods, appliances, or personal effects. The cost of shipping your car to your new home. The cost of shipping your household pets to your new home. So if you have to put Fido in a special crate and put him on an airline, that's a moving of your household property. He is a personal asset of yours. And number six, the cost of moving household goods and personal effects from a place other than your former home to the extent that the cost does not exceed what it would have cost to move them from your former home. So perhaps you have personal goods that you keep in storage because there's no room for them in your house and now you're moving cross country, you're taking everything in your house plus everything you have in storage. That's all going to be allowed as long as the cost of picking it up from storage does not exceed the cost of moving it from your home or to the extent that it does not, not exceed. Maybe you've got horses, you need to move those. Those may not be on your home, they may be somewhere else. So that's a pet that doesn't even live with you. 
Allowable travel costs. Transportation and lodging for yourself and members of your household while traveling from your former home to your new home, including expenses for the day you arrive. So the day you arrive at your new home, you can pay for hotel and deduct it. But on day number two in your new home, no deduction for hotel. If you drive your car, you can claim the actual cost of gas and oil paid during your move, or you can claim a standard mileage allowance of 19 cents per mile for miles driven in the first half of 2011. That is January 1 through uh, June 30th. You can claim 23.5 cents per mile for miles driven after June 30th through the end of the year. So 2011 was a year where we had split mileage, one mileage rate for the first half of the year, another mileage for the second half of the year. So of course you need to be asking your client for what date they moved to know which mileage rate applies. Lodging expenses in the area of your former home within one day after you could no longer live in your former home because your furniture had been moved. So they're, very, they're being very generous here. They do understand that you might spend an entire day packing up all of your goods and belongings and putting them into a container and then shipping them, and now you have a house but no bed. So you're allowed to uh, pay for a hotel and deduct that hotel that last night in your old home. You can also deduct expenses for, or pardon me, you can only deduct expenses for one trip to your new home for yourself and members of your household. However, you do not have to travel together or at the same time. Now, one of the things that comes up quite often with my clients that I did want to point out is my clients might rent a U-Haul. And they might live, say, in Portland, and they're moving to Seattle. Clearly a qualifying distance and clearly a place that they could move all their stuff themselves. So they rent a U-Haul. And they pack up the U-Haul, and they drive the U-Haul to Seattle. And they turn around and drive the U-Haul back. And then maybe they return the U-Haul um, because it's expensive, and now they're going to finish making a few more trips, maybe one or two more trips, where they're hauling stuff in the back of their pickup truck or whatever. Well, <clears throat> I would interpret any cost associated with moving stuff to be a cost allocable to moving household goods. So it's possible a person could be moving their own things using their own vehicle and be making multiple trips to do it. And I would put that under the cost of moving household goods category. But then there's that final trip where everything's moved or you're moving with your final stuff. And you get in the car and you drive yourself and that's the final trip. For the portion of the trip that's associated with moving yourself, you're going to put that on the allowable travel cost line and you are allowed to only claim the cost of moving yourself once. But you and your family don't have to travel together or in the same vehicle or at the same time. So you might drive in the family car and your wife might drive in the other family car and that would be two cars traveling. Or it could be that you drive in the family car and the rest of your family, wife and kids, get on a plane and fly. Any of those are acceptable. I made multiple trips to get all my stuff up here. I came from California. I was driving stuff back and forth on two or three trips. Is it those intermittent trips aren't really considered part of the move? Well, no, what I said was, you have to look at the reason for the trip. If you come up on a trip to house hunt, that's not a moving expense. If you come up on a trip to move yourself, that's allowed once. If you come up on a trip to deliver your household goods, that's a moving of the household good expense. And you might need more than one trip to move all your household items. It would depend on what's practical. It might be that you rent a U-Haul, and it's going to cost you know, $2,000 to rent the U-Haul and load it and drive it and deposit it and then have, you know, leave it in a new city. And some people would do that. Other people might, maybe it's a closer move, and they're going to pay for a smaller U-Haul, maybe make two or three trips. Or maybe they're going to take a U-Haul for one of the trips and then take the rest of the property in a trailer that they pull behind their car. I, what you look at is what's happening. Am I moving my household goods or am I moving myself? And if it's a cost associated with moving the household goods, I would put it on the household good line of the 3903. And if it's a cost associated with moving myself or my family, I put it on the travel expense line. And IRS is simply saying that when you're deducting the travel cost, it can only be for one trip. And they absolutely do not allow house hunting. Now, it might be you came on the trip to interview for a job. And if you did that, that's not a house hunting expense. That would be an employee business expense. Non-deductible moving expenses. You cannot claim a deduction for any of the following. Any part of the purchase price of your new home, car tags, 
driver's license, expenses of buying or selling a home, the expenses of getting or breaking a lease, home improvements to help you sell your home, loss on the sale of your home, losses from disposing of memberships and clubs, meal expenses, mortgage penalties, pre-move house hunting expenses, real estate taxes, refitting carpets and draperies, security deposits including any given up because of the move, storage charges except those incurred in transit and for foreign moves, temporary living expenses, and of course, never any double deductions. You cannot claim a moving deduction and a business expense deduction for the same expenses. So it could be that you're moving yourself and your household goods and your family, but you also are moving your business and all of your business property. And you are allowed to claim costs associated with moving your business on Schedule C. You would claim expenses, personal expenses of the move on 3903, but you would not claim business move expenses on Schedule C and then duplicate those on the 3903. Now what happens when your employer helps to pay for the move? Your employer may pay all or a part of the cost of your move. You may only claim a deduction for allowable expenses that exceed the employer paid expenses. Non-deductible moving expenses paid by an employer on behalf of an employee are a taxable fringe benefit, and they will be identified, if they were paid and identified correctly, on the W-2 with a code P. If your employer paid non-deductible expenses for you, your employer must include the cost of those non-deductible expenses in your income. They are considered to be a taxable fringe benefit. One of the things that IRS is really hot and heavy on when it is auditing businesses is how those businesses are compensating their workers. And when I sit in audits with the IRS on business tax returns, what I am observing the IRS is most keenly interested in is violations of payroll procedures and payroll laws, and that's what they're looking at. So the employer is not allowed to pay expenses for an employee that are not allowable expenses unless the employer treats that as payroll to that employee and grosses the employee's W-2 up by that amount. So in effect, the employee has to pay tax on the benefit that the employer just gave them. And the most common type of non-deductible expenses that employers pay include house hunting expenses and real estate sales expenses, temporary living expenses, and meal expenses while traveling and living in temporary quarters. So let's just suppose you're a pretty high-end engineer and Intel out there wants you pretty bad and they're willing to move you from New York City to San Jose, California. So they give you a nice sign-on bonus. They tell you that they're going to pay all the costs associated with packing and shipping all of your household belongings. They're also going to pay for you and your family to come out on at least two house hunting trips to look at properties in San Jose to pick one. They're also going to pay for any temporary housing that you have to reside in while you're waiting for your new home to be available for you. They pay all of those expenses. It's a great deal, except your W-2 is going to go up a lot because some of those expenses are a tax-free fringe benefit to you, but much of the other expenses are not a tax-free fringe benefit, and your employer has to calculate how much and keep track of how much it's spent on non-deductible items and gross your W-2 up by that. Now, of course, if your employer just gives you $20,000 of taxable fringe benefits and you're expected to pay tax on that, that would be a pretty hefty number. So what the employer does to compensate for that is it grosses you up even more. And the additional gross up goes to pay the taxes on the first gross up. So it's almost like this spiraling thing where your, your sign on bonus and your moving expense and your gross ups can be huge. And you'll have someone arrive in your office with a W-2 that could be one and a half times their normal rate of pay. And that, that extra 50% is all for the non-deductible moving expenses and all of the gross ups associated with them. And of course, they're going to have a bunch of withholding to offset all of that. So 
So employers who pay non-deductible moving expenses for their employees will often give the employee additional moving pay. And this added pay is used to pay the extra taxes the employee will owe because of the gross up in income from the non-deductible reimbursements. Now I think back in time, my very, very first year as a tax preparer, I had a client. She had been moved to Portland, Oregon by Nike from somewhere out east. And I can remember the conniptions she was having over the gross up on her W-2 and how much tax it was costing her. And this is in the day where a lot more was deductible. That uh, it was something claimed on Schedule A and back then house hunting and temporary housing was allowed. But she still far exceeded the allowable amounts and had this big gross up on her W-2. And she owed that year and was not happy. It's just one of the most vivid things I can remember. And I was trying to explain to her, yes, you've been grossed up, there's been these extra taxes, but it really cemented in her mind a negative reaction that never left her. So here's an illustration I've put together for you of a client who has moved and has received deductible and non-deductible reimbursements from his employer. On January 1, Johnny Mover was hired by TJ Sports. And TJ Sports reimbursed Johnny all costs of relocating from his home in Texas to his new home in Washington, as follows. They paid $3,000 of deductible moving expenses. They also paid $8,000 of non-deductible moving expenses and they gave him another $4,500. So how does that all equate on his W-2? Well, you have to start with his base salary and say, okay, how much is Johnny being paid in the first place? He's being paid $75,000. And what is the taxable fringe benefits that he received? That's another gross up of $8,000. And then there's another additional gross up for the taxes he owes on the $8,000. And of course, the taxes that he owes on the $8,000, if they give him that money, that's another gross up. So they're going to add $8,000 plus $45,000 to his W-2. So his W-2 is going to report $87,500 in box one. Now the $3,000 amount right here, that does not appear anywhere in box one. But it does appear in box 12 with a code P. That code P tells you that Johnny's employer paid $3,000 of deductible moving expenses for him. It's been excluded from his pay. Johnny cannot claim deduction for that $3,000. But if Johnny has additional moving expenses that are deductible that were not reimbursed by his employer, he could claim those. All right, so we're on to uh, the next topic of the day, <clears throat> which is line 27. Now, I was a little bit slow picking up on this. One of my staff kept correcting me because I kept referring to this as 50% of self-employment tax. And she kept saying, no, the line has changed to the deductible part of self-employment tax. And I was going, er, 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 why would they change it? For all the years I've ever done taxes, it's been 50% of the self-employment tax. Why is it now the deductible part of the self-employment tax? <clears throat> she kept correcting me and saying it's no longer 50%. But finally, late last night, I was looking at the form instructions for Schedule SE, and I noticed that it's no longer 50%. It's 56%, something like that. The print was real small. I couldn't read it. And it suddenly dawned on me, that's right. The reason is for 2011 and again for 12, self-employment tax is comprised of two rates of tax. One is the employee's share of Social Security and Medicare tax, and the other is the employer's share of Social Security and Medicare tax. And for 2011 and again in 2012, the employee share has been reduced by, 20, or by 2 percent, reduced from 6.2 percent to 4.2 percent. So it's actually a pretty big percentage-wise reduction in the tax. In any event, it, what it means is that the deduction is still for the employer, employer share of 6.2% rather than the employee share of 4.2%, and that's why the deduction is not 50% this year. Now that we got that straight, let's go into the class. And if I fumble and refer to it as 50% of the SC tax, forgive me. It's just 20 years of habit. The, the employer share of Social Security is still 6.2%, and when you're looking at the amount you can deduct on uh, the front part of your 1040 form, it's the employer share of Social Security and Medicare tax that is deducted. So let's take a look. Any discussion of SE tax would involve a discussion of who pays it in the first place, and we do get into more detail on how to prepare Schedule SE and calculate the tax in our course in self-employment. Um, so today we're not really going to spend a lot of time on how to complete the form. But I feel you just can't talk about who gets a deduction for the employer's share of the tax without discussing who has to pay the tax in the first place. So we will touch on that. You must pay self-employment tax on net income from self-employment. 
and all of the following sources are income, of income are subject to self-employment tax. Obviously, if you are self-employed filing Schedule C or F as a sole proprietor, you are going to be paying self-employment tax, assuming you have a profit. Also, if you have partnership income and you are a general partner, or you receive guaranteed payments in performance of duties for a partnership in which you are a partner, you are going to get a K-1. And the K-1 is going to show income. Line 1 of K-1 shows ordinary income or loss from the partnership. And then another line on the form, I think line 10, shows guaranteed payments. I need to have the K-1 in front of me. But anyway, there's a line on the form that shows guaranteed payments. And <clears throat> both of those lines are subject to self-employment tax if you are active in the partnership. And when we get into our course on S corporations and LLCs, we discuss how you identify whether you have an active or passive partner. Also, if you have wages or self-employment earnings as a church minister, you have to pay self-employment tax. And look at that it says wages. So a minister who is paid on a W-2 is still expected to pay self-employment tax. And finally, non-employee compensation reported as other income on Form 1040, Line 21. In some cases, you must complete Schedule SE and pay self-employment tax on income that is reported on 1099 Miscellaneous Box 3, Other Income. So what is self-employment tax? Well, it is the equivalent of Social Security and Medicare taxes that are payable on employee wages. For many self-employed individuals, self-employment tax exceeds income tax amounts that are payable for the year. And without advanced planning and proper prepayment of taxes through withholdings or quarterly estimates, self-employment tax liabilities can create a very large balance due when an individual files his or her return. I quite frankly find that my clients, most of my clients who are self-employed are absolutely unprepared for what they owe as a result of being self-employed. Um, particularly, you know, even when they've been that way for a few years, it just always seems to be a surprise to them how much they owe. And there are some who are good about paying their quarterlies, but I find there's many more who are not. And in a way, the self-employment tax, uh, by being so large, makes it very difficult to be self-employed. Uh, but when you do pay self-employment tax, there is this small token adjustment you get to claim. <laughs> uh, no longer called 50% of self-employment tax, but called the deductible portion of self-employment tax. Um, so let's compare self-employment and employee payroll taxes for a minute. The amount of Social Security and Medicare taxes attributable to wage and self-employment compensation are essentially the same, but how these taxes are assessed and who pays them is a primary difference. If you are an employee, your employer is required to withhold 6.2% of your earnings for Social Security tax and 1.45% of your earnings for Medicare tax. For 2011 and 12, the withholding that the employer does for the employee is 4.2% rather than 6.2%. Your employer is going to pay the 6.2% and 1.45% to the IRS for you, and then they're also going to pay another 6.2% and 1.45% for you. When you add all of those taxes up, the amount you pay and the amount your employer pays on your behalf is 15.3% or 13.3% for 2011 and 12. So when your employer pays this portion here and this portion for you, it doesn't hurt so much because you're not actually paying that tax. And the other two taxes up here, your share of Medicare and your share of Social Security, those are mandatory withholdings that come out of your W-2. You never get your hands on the money. You never get a chance to spend it. <clears throat> it's already been allocated and sent to the IRS. So the main thing that comes with being self-employed is no one is withholding tax for you. No one's helping to pay the tax for you. You're responsible for all of it and it can be a pretty hefty bill. Ministers, if you are a minister of a church, your earnings for the services you perform in your capacity as a minister are subject to self-employment tax, even if you perform these services as an employee of that church. Now some ministers, and you may have heard of it as a tax preparer as well, are eligible to claim exemption from Social Security tax. But there's a lot more to that situation than just claiming the exemption. They're essentially arguing when they claim that exemption that they don't believe in the Social Security system. They have a religious objection to it. And they don't want to pay into it because it's against the religion. And above and beyond that, they're also saying that when they retire, they're not going to draw on the system. They're not going to claim Social Security benefits. So this Form 4029 
has to be filed to claim exemption from Social Security and Medicare taxes. And essentially, when you file that, you're saying, hey, I'm not going to claim Social Security when I retire either. It's, a, it's against my religious principles. Once you explain that to a minister, they pretty much agree to pay the tax. Self-employment tax on minister income, how does that work? All of the following must be included in gross income when figuring the amount of income subject to SE tax. Salaries and fees for your ministerial services. Offerings you receive for marriages, baptisms, funerals, masses, etc. The value of meals and lodging provided to you, your spouse, and your dependents for your employer's convenience. The fair market value of parsonage provided to you, including the cost of utilities that are furnished by your employer and any rental allowance, including amounts for payment of utilities that are paid to you. Also, any amount a church pays towards your income tax or SE tax, other than amounts that are withheld from your salary. So technically speaking, if you work for a church and the church doesn't know what it's doing, which is common, they're going to have a W-2 that shows your wages in box one, your social security wages in box three, your, your uh, Medicare wages in box five, and all of the corresponding withholdings. Technically, that's wrong. The church is not allowed to pay those taxes for you. The W-2 is completely wrong. And technically, what's supposed to happen is you're going to show the taxes that were paid on your behalf by the church as amounts added to your wage income. And then you're going to report all of that on Schedule SE and pay self-employment tax on it. I'm not quite sure why churches don't figure this out, but they, I have one or two churches that I've worked with over the years that really get it and do a good job of it, and many, many others who, who get it wrong. But that's a whole other class, not today's class. Uh, there's a question in the classroom, if a minister gets a W-2, is he self-employed? Technically, no, he is an employee. It's just that, for whatever reason, the law says churches cannot pay, so, uh, pay the payroll tax for ministers. And so the minister is responsible for paying that tax, and they do so through self-employment tax. There's some, some reason for it politically in ancient history of our IRS code that I've never read. If someone wants to let me know what that history is, I'd be happy to share it. Uh, here is an example of how all of this works. Because of course, ministers are allowed to receive a tax-free housing allowance, um, and they are also receiving their wages. The housing allowance and the wages are both subject to self-employment tax but the housing allowance is excluded from income tax. So how does all that work? Well, we have Pastor Roy Rogers, who receives an annual salary of $50,000 as a full-time minister. The $50,000 includes $10,000 that is designated as parsonage allowance to pay rent and utilities for his home. Pastor Rogers is not exempt from SE tax. He must include $50,000, the $40,000 of wage, plus the $10,000 of parsonage when figuring his net earnings for self-employment purposes. The $10,000 parsonage allowance is exempt from income tax, but is not exempt from SEC tax. Thus, Pastor Rogers will report the following amounts on his tax return. He will report $40,000 on line 7 of Form 1040 as wage income. He will report $50,000 of self-employment wages on Schedule SE line 2, and he will report the deductible portion of his self-employment tax on Form 1040 line 27. Deducting the employer equivalent portion of self employment tax, use Schedule SE to figure the amount of self-employment tax that you owe. You can claim the employer equivalent portion of your self-employment tax as an adjustment to income on Form 1040, Line 27. So that's the most detailed explanation I can give of who pays self-employment tax and who gets to claim the deduction, but the employer portion of the self-employment tax will be above the line deduction. The next topic of the day is a new one for me teaching. I've been teaching adjustments to income for several years, but this year I decided to put quite a bit of time and energy into another portion or expanding on the deduction for the self-employed SEP simple and qualified plans. I seem to have more and more clients who are qualifying for and claiming this, and it just might be the changing times of my own business, or it could be just more savvy taxpayers out there in general. But the plans are confusing. I never seem to quite be able to remember the rules between them. And every time I have a client, I'm looking them up, trying to figure it out. And I know that if I have that problem, then lots of people have that problem. So I decided it was time to really expand on it. And so I've spent the last three days doing the best job I can of expanding on it and putting it into language that I understand. And hopefully, I will be, help you understand. Um, before I move on to it, though, I see Janet Cranston has a question. What about employees of a church who are not ministers who get a W-2? Are all wages listed in box one subject to SE tax? 
the rule for church employees and whether or not they have to pay self-employment tax, generally no. Most church employees, other than ministers, the church can pay the payroll tax for them. It's something that is for ministers. But there are exceptions. But again, this is not a class on churches. That would be a whole section that I haven't written. So let's take a look at the next line on 1040, line 28, where you claim a deduction as a self-employed person who contributed to a SEP, simple, or qualified plan. You can deduct contributions you make to your retirement plan that you set up for your employees. If you are a sole proprietor, you can deduct contributions you make to the plan for yourself. How much you are allowed to contribute to a plan depends on the type of plan that you have. And you can choose between a variety of retirement plans, which are summarized in this table in front of you. And I pulled this from IRS publication 560. So we're going to spend some time talking in particular about SEPs, SIMPLES, and individual 401ks, which are a form of qualified plan. <clears throat> those are the three that I'm going to talk about because those are the three my clients walk in the door with. And looking at the table, we see we have the SEP being the type of plan, and then the chart gives you information about each plan. The last date for making a contribution to the plan. The maximum amount you are allowed to contribute to the plan the maximum amount you are allowed to deduct, and when to set up the plan. And of these, the SEP is the most flexible. The last date for contributing to the plan is the due date of the employer's return, including extensions. The maximum amount you are allowed to contribute to the SEP is the smaller of $49,000, or 25% of the participant's compensation. The maximum deduction is going to be 25% of all participants' compensation. And when to set up the plan? Any time up to the due date of the employer's tax return, including extensions. So SEPs stand out because not only can you make a deduction after the year is over, you can do it all the way up until the due date of the return, including extensions. And even if you don't have a plan in place during 2011, you can open it up and make contributions and claim them as a deduction on the 2011 return. Now, if you are a self-employed individual, that would give you all the way until October 15, 2012 to set up a plan and contribute to it and claim a deduction on it for your 2011 return. And I have clients every year who file extensions specifically to wait until October 15th to make a contribution to their plan. That's the only reason they filed an extension. The next kind of plan is a simple IRA and simple 401k. These are a salary reduction plan as well as a matching or non-elective contribution plan. And the last date for making contributions would depend on what kind of a contribution is being made. If you're making a salary contribution deduction, you have to make the contribution within 30 days after the end of the month for which the contributions are to be made. So typically, that's associated with payroll, and it would coincide with paying of the employee, and therefore would need to happen in 2011. But the matching election or matching non-elective contribution made by the employer can be made up until the due date of the employer's return, including extensions. So it's these differences between the type of contribution that is being made that add confusion to it. What is the maximum amount of the contribution? Well, for the employee, the employee is allowed to make a, ma um, a maximum contribution of $11,500 to his or her own plan during the year. And if that person is age 50 or older, the maximum amount is 14000 What is the maximum deduction? Well, it is the same as the maximum contribution. And when to set up the plan? You can set up a simple plan any time between 1-1 and 10-1 for the calendar year to which the plan applies. So a simple plan cannot be created after the year is over. A SEP can be created after the year is over, but a simple has to be set up by October 1 of the year to which you want contributions to be made and apply. For a new employer coming into existence after 10-1, you might not be able to meet that 10-1 date because you just newly created your company. Um, so they'll give you some grace, but it still has to be before the end of the year. The next type of plan is a qualified plan. And we have under that qualified defined contribution plans, and we also have qualified defined benefit plans. Well, these are essentially 401k plans. And 401k plans are more complex to set up. They're more expensive to administer, but they offer greater flexibility to the employer. Employers typically, you know, big employers are going to have very complex plans, and they're going to pay whole teams of staff and advisors to administer them. 
But it is possible as an individual sole proprietor to set up a 401k plan just for yourself. You can do that. And we're going to talk about some of the rules around that. And how do those work? Well, you can make a deferral as an employee to your 401k plan. We're used to that. We see it on people's W-2s. They put money into their 401k plan throughout the year. Employer contribution, money purchase or profit sharing is due by the due date of the employer's return, including extensions. So how much is an employee allowed to contribute to his or her 401k plan? Well, they can defer up to $16,500, but if they're age 50 or older, they can put up to $22,000 in. And how much is the employer allowed to put in the plan? Well, the employer is allowed to put up to $49,000, or 100% of the participant's compensation whichever is smaller. What is the rate of contribution by the employer for the employee? The maximum rate of uh, participation in the plan is 25% of the participant's compensation. And when must those contributions be made? By the end of the year. And then we have something here called a qualified defined benefit plan. And how the calculations for these are made are based on actuarial assumptions and computations and I am not an enrolled actuary, nor am I an enrolled retirement plan agent. So these are very, very specialized areas that I am not really qualified to go into, but I wanted to introduce them to you so that we could talk about what happens when you have a client who comes in and they've made a contribution to a plan and they want to claim an adjustment to income for it. Where do you start in terms of identifying what they've got and the amount that they can deduct? So that table gives you an introduction. There's an entire publication that goes into more detail on them but I didn't even get into the part of reading instructions for filing employer 401k forms. That's an entirely other topic. So that, in a nutshell, is as close as I could get to simplifying those three different types of plans that can cause an adjustment to income to be claimed by a small business owner on his or her return. They all essentially go back to the owner. The owner is the one who is allowed to claim the deduction for contributions that the owner makes to his or her own plan. But if the owner makes a contribution to his or, own, his or her own plan, in most cases, the plan is also going to have to cover other employees, and the employer will have to make contributions to those employees. But contributions to the plans of employees are not deducted as an adjustment to income on the employer's return. They are deducted on the business return that the employer uses. If the business is filing a Schedule C, contributions to the plans of employees will be claimed on the Schedule C. And that would include contributions to the plan of an employee who happens to be a spouse or dependent or child of the owner. If you have an S corporation, what then? Well, all of the instructions are silent on S corporations because if you are a participant in a set plan that is administered by an S corporation, you are an employee of the S corporation. And the S corporation is the one that's going to be making contributions to the plan and claiming the deduction on the S corporation's return. So it won't appear anywhere on the individual return. But partners, in a partnership, that does flow through. Because partners in a partnership are not employees of the partnership. That's a fundamental rule of partnerships that differs from S corporations. Owners who perform services for a corporation, including an S corporation, are by definition and under the law always employees. But partners who are owners of a partnership are never employees of the partnership. And that's why it's going to flow through as a self-employed deduction for partners and sole proprietors, but not for S corporation shareholders. The next deduction in line is self-employed health insurance deduction line 29. So we're scooting on down. Certain self-employed individuals may be able to claim an above-the-line deduction for health insurance premiums. The deduction is available to sole proprietors who file Schedule C or F, General partners who receive guaranteed payments allocable to health insurance expenses that are reported on Schedule K-1, and S corporation shareholders for whom the corporation made health insurance payments that are reported on the shareholder's W-2. So this is pretty specific wording here, and the reason I've worded it this way is because that's how the IRS requires it. You ha if you are a sole proprietor, you can have health insurance in your own name, and you are allowed to claim a self-employed health insurance deduction. Of course, there are limits, and we're going to talk about that. If you are a general partner, however, in a partnership, in order to claim a deduction for self-employed health insurance, that partnership has to make payments on that health insurance for you, and it has to report that payment on your K-1. And if you are an owner in an S corporation, 
the corporation must make payments on your health insurance for you and report the cost of that health insurance as wages paid to you on your W-2. So there's very specific rules. But in every one of these cases, if the business has followed the rules, the owner of the business will be allowed to claim a self-employed health insurance deduction. So the next part of today's class is to talk about who is allowed to claim the deduction and how you calculate it and put it on the return. We'll start with Schedule C and F filers. Self-employed individuals may claim a deduction on Schedule C or F for health insurance premiums. Self-employed individuals may not deduct health insurance premiums paid for themselves or their family on Schedule C. This is a rule that a lot of tax preparers seem to have a hard time grasping. There is a line on Schedule C which says health insurance. But that is a line that is for employees. If you are an owner of a business and you are a sole proprietor and you have employees and you cover those employees with health insurance and you pay their health insurance for them, that's when you claim the deduction on Schedule C. But you never claim a deduction on Schedule C for health insurance premiums you pay for yourself under a plan in your name. The deduction that you claim as a self-employed health insurance deduction is limited to the net profit from Schedule C or F minus the deductible portion of self-employment tax. So your self-employed health insurance deduction can never be more than your income from self-employment minus your employer's share of self-employment tax. Contributions for the sole proprietor's benefit to a SEP simple or qualified plan also reduce your income from the business. A self-employed person may be able to deduct the amount paid for health insurance for himself, his spouse, and his dependents as an above-the-line deduction on Form 1040, Line 29. The insurance is also allowed to cover his or her child who is under the age of 27 at the end of 2011, even if that child is not his or her dependent. Use the self-employed health insurance deduction worksheet to determine if an additional deduction is allowed. And I do have that worksheet coming up. And of course, we have the worksheet. It is the worksheet for self-employed health insurance deduction, line 29. The IRS provides this worksheet to help determine the amount of health insurance deduction you can claim. The worksheet does provide some guidance on when health insurance premiums can be deducted. It also applies limits to the amount of long-term care insurance premiums that can be deducted and the overall amount of deduction that can be claimed based on your earnings from self-employment. So, in effect, the worksheet, quite frankly, is one I've never filled out. If you understand the rules, most worksheets, you don't need them once you understand the rules. The purpose of the worksheet is to walk you through each of the rules and make sure you understand them. So why don't we just take a look at this worksheet together to see the types of things that it's clarifying. So on line one, it says, enter the total amount paid in 2011 for health insurance coverage established under your business in 2011 for you, your spouse, and your dependents. Your health insurance can also cover your child who was under age 27 at the end of the year. But do not include amounts for the following. Amounts for any months that you are eligible to participate in a health plan subsidized by you or your spouse's employer or the employer of either your dependent for your child who was under the age of 27 at the end of the year. So you're only allowed to enter amounts you paid for health insurance for periods of time that you are not eligible to participate in an employer plan. And you're only allowed to enter the cost of health insurance you paid for your spouse or your dependent for periods of time that they were not eligible to be part of an employer plan. So if your spouse is covered by an employer plan, you cannot claim a deduction for health insurance you paid for your spouse. If your child is covered by an employer plan, you cannot claim an expense for health insurance you paid for your child. And if you are covered by an employer plan, you cannot claim health insurance expenses you pay for yourself. Also, do not include any amounts paid from a retirement plan distribution that were non-taxable because of your retired public safety officer, or any amounts you included on Form 8885, Line 4, or any qualified health insurance premiums you paid to the U.S. Treasury HCTC, or any health coverage tax credit advance payments shown in Box 1 of 1099H, or any payments for long for qualified long-term care insurance, C line two. So uh, they want you to put long-term health insurance premiums on a different line. So we move down to line two because this is the line where you enter the cost of premiums you paid for long-term care insurance. And the reason they separate long-term care insurance out is your ability to claim a deduction for long-term care insurance is based on your age. 
the maximum amount you can claim for long-term care insurance that you pay for an individual is $340 if that person is age 40 or younger. The most you can claim for long-term care insurance premiums paid in a year for an individual is 4240 and that's only if the person is age 71 or older. Now what I have found personally, at least here in the state of Oregon, when I have clients who are paying for long-term care insurance premiums, the amount that they're paying is never more than the amount shown based on their age. So typically they're not limited in the amount that they can deduct, but it could certainly be possible a person could sign up for long-term care insurance and some uh, fancy policy that is more than these limits. I've just not encountered it personally. So it asks you to add up line one and two, where you've separated out the insurance that is for a period of time where you were not eligible to participate in an employer plan, your spouse was not eligible to participate in an employer plan, or your dependents were not eligible to participate in an employer plan, and add to that on line two any amounts paid for long-term care insurance premiums subject to the limits based on your age. And it goes through and applies a number of other limits to arrive at the deductible part. And of course, one of those limits is your income from self-employment. You have to have income from self-employment. It also asks you to factor in any amount that was excluded from income on Form 2555. So let's get past the worksheet and go into some more descriptive reading, including how to treat the deduction for individuals who are in partnerships or who are owners of S corporations. And it used to be a few years ago that, not that many years ago either, that when a person was an owner in an S corporation and they had health insurance, you just stuck it on the line. And if they were a partner in a partnership and they had health insurance, you gave them a deduction for health insurance premiums as an above the line deduction. It was, there was not a lot of brain power that went into it. And then if you read QuickFinder as I do, QuickFinder started make, making some rumblings. Oh, the IRS is looking at this. You need to have a company plan in place. Um, and if you don't have a company plan in place and didn't put it in the wages, then maybe you could put it on line 21 as other income and then deduct it out again on line, uh, the self-employed health insurance line, line 29. You could maybe try those things. And then if you clock forward a little, QuickFinder was changing the rules again. It's not that QuickFinder was changing the rules so much as that IRS was trying to clarify things. And the IRS was trying to make up its mind what it wanted to see done. And at the strictest side of the equation, you had a situation where the only time an owner of a business could claim a deduction is if they had a plan set up in the name of the employer of which they were an, a, you know, a beneficiary or an employee. And that was getting to be pretty restrictive. What about small employers who can't afford to provide health insurance to their employees? Now you're saying that if they offer it to themselves, they can't deduct it anywhere except on Schedule A. And that was getting to be really restrictive. And even I myself as an owner in an S corporation started having tantrums. Are you telling me that if I set up a health insurance plan for my company and I'm the only person participating in it, that that's going to be a problem? I can't deduct it? And what about, do I have to have it through the company? What if I take it out in my own name? Because corporate health insurance policies are more money often than individual policies. So you're telling me I can only deduct it if I take out a corporate policy rather than an individual policy? I was like having tirades over this because I'd gone out of my way to find the most affordable plan out there, and it was definitely not a company plan. So what does all of that mean? Well, um, <laughs> I, in my own stubborn way, and I'm sure a lot of tax professionals do this, we choose to do what we want to do just because it has to be right. And in the end, it turned out I was right on this one. It was like, no, I'm not going to be forced into a company plan. I can have insurance in my own name, but I have to follow certain procedures on the tax return. And this is the interesting part. After putting it all in writing in a dozen different ways to confuse everyone, the IRS has finally clarified what a small business owner has to do. And the first bit of information came out in a headliner, number 163, that was published back in 2006. And that was probably the one that got people really confused and irate. But then what it did is it published another notice back in 2008, IRS Notice 2008-1. And for those of you who are online and have a PDF of this, you can click on that blue link here. You can see where I've got the finger pointing. It will actually link you to that IRS Notice and you can read it for yourself. And that IRS Notice finally started to make some clarification of how things are handled. And uh, it did so in a Q&A format as well. Since then, IRS on its website now has a page devoted to the self-employed health insurance deduction, and it does a beautiful job of explaining or summarizing all of the rules down much more succinctly and precisely. So I'm going to explain to you what the rules are in a nutshell so that you know whether or not your client can claim a deduction. 
the summary of the provisions are that partners and 2% or more S corporation shareholders are allowed to claim a self-employed health insurance deduction only if the partnership or S corporation maintains a company group health insurance plan. However, the plan does not need to be in the name of the company. It could be in the name of the individual as long as the company either pays it directly or reimburses the individual for it. When the company does so, that payment is considered to be compensation to the owner. And if the owner is a shareholder in the S corporation, a 2% or more shareholder in the S corporation, then that is added to their wages as income on the W-2. So you should be looking to see, anytime you have a person who is an employee of their own S corporation, you should be looking to see a gross up on their W-2 with box seven wages oddly enough, being more than Social Security and Medicare wages. So for example, if you have an S Corporation shareholder who drew a W-2 salary for the year of $100,000 and the company paid $10,000 of health insurance for him, then his W-2 will have box one wages of $110,000 and Social Security wages of only $100,000. That is correct. It's top heavy. It's weird. And payroll companies not so good about getting this right. So when my client comes in and they say, yeah, the company paid my health insurance for me, I look at the W-2 and I say, but wait, your W-2 is wrong. Well, that's how my, health, my payroll company did it. Well, your payroll company doesn't know the rules that you're operating under as a, a, an S corporation. You need to go and tell them to gross up the owner payroll by the amount that the company paid in health insurance, which typically means correcting the W-2 and correcting the payroll reports that went with it. So those corrections have to happen. Once they've happened, now you can claim the deduction. Well, that seems weird. I've just grossed up my W-2 by 10,000. How is that saving me anything? Well, you have to think about how the tax return works for the S Corporation. The S Corporation is reporting income, and it's reporting expenses. And one of the expenses it writes off is payroll, including payroll paid to you. So the S Corporation is deducting the, payroll, is deducting the health insurance. It's just deducting it as payroll rather than health insurance. Now the incomes come onto your tax return on your W-2 and you put that income up there and you go down to the self-employed health insurance line and deduct it off again. So why in the world does our federal government make it that complicated? I don't know. I come from Canada and there things were much simpler. We had national health insurance and we just didn't have to worry about these things. But here in the United States, I'm just not sure why this is the way they do it. So if you are an owner in an S corporation, the S Corporation can pay your health insurance for you or it can reimburse you for a policy that you maintain in your own name if you are an owner in that S Corporation. Whatever amount of health insurance that S Corporation pays for you, it has to gross it up on your W-2 and you report it as wage income and then you subtract it out again as a self-employed health insurance deduction. That's the S Corporation method. The partnership method works differently again. Partners in a partnership are never employees of the partnership. They will not be given a W-2. So the way the partnership works is the partnership is going to pay the health insurance for the partner. And it will treat that payment as a guaranteed payment. So in an S corporation, you are an employee, you receive a W-2. In a partnership, you are never an employee. So if the partnership pays you a wage, quotes, it's not a wage, it's a guaranteed payment. And the guaranteed payment is identified on the Schedule K-1. There's an actual line that says guaranteed payments. And any amount of health insurance that the partnership paid for you will add to the amount shown in that guaranteed payment box. So if you have a partner in a partnership who has no guaranteed payments, they have no self-employed health insurance deduction that they can claim. Someone needs to go back and correct the partnership for tax return and correct the K-1s in order for you to claim that deduction. Have I had that happen? This year. So 2010. Filing season, we're into 2011 filing season doing 2010 returns. And I have a client come to me. He is the controlling partner in a partnership. Makes good money, has several partners, but he's like the 80, 90% controlling partner. And uh, the partnership plan makes no provision for health insurance. In fact, specifically says that the, the partnership will not offer health insurance to partners. And I explain, well, you can't claim a self-employed health insurance deduction then. You're going to have to rewrite the partnership agreement. So he says, OK, and he gets his attorneys to rewrite the partnership agreement. They rewrite the partnership agreement. His CPA firm somewhere in California prepares the partnership return, and he brings me the K-1. 
and no health insurance is indicated on the K-1. So I say to them, your CPA firm has to redo this now. If the, if the partnership paid your health insurance premiums for you, the partnership has to show that as a guaranteed payment, and it has to show the code on the K-1 showing what amount was paid for health insurance. So uh, that's on extension right now. Well, the CPA firm is, re <laughs> is amending that. Now, interestingly enough, that my client argued with me about it because his CPA firm was giving him pushback, saying, I, we don't think that should be necessary. <laughs> However, I did show him the, the page on the IRS's website. Maybe during the break, I'll call it up and I'll show it to you, where the page on the IRS's website is explicitly clear that it must be reported that way. So uh, we're on extension while he's getting all of that corrected. All right, so partnerships and S-corporations are special in that there are a lot of work with technical steps that have to be followed in a precise order. And if you don't follow those things in a precise order, then the IRS will throw out the deduction. <laughs> Comment in the classroom, that's why they do it that way. It doesn't make sense to me that our federal government would create an ability to claim a deduction and then cover it with red tape, because that's essentially all of that this is, is red tape. It serves no purpose in my mind whatsoever other than to create red tape. Um, and you know, for those people who are not smart enough to know the rules or don't have preparers who know the rules, um, it can create financial hardship for no perceivable reason on my part. But I don't want to act political or anything about this. It's just, I don't understand why it's so complicated, but I know what to do. <laughs> OK, the next item in line is the penalty on early withdrawal of savings, line 30. And John is asking, and did you say the premium amount is taxable wages but not subject to Social Security and Medicare tax? Yes, that is what I said. You put the number in box one, and box one will be bigger than Social Security wages and bigger than Medicare wages, unless, of course, there are uh, contributions to 401k plans along those lines. But yeah, it's a very odd thing. And as I've said, payroll companies get confused and scratch their heads. So you have to be very clear with the payroll company exactly what it is that you want to see done. Our firm does payroll, so we've, we're pretty good at masters at it now <laughs> with our clients when we do their payroll. But when they use other companies to do payroll, um, very often there's corrections until those companies have been trained and the customer has been trained to make sure their payroll companies are doing it correctly. So next in line, penalty on early withdrawal of savings, line 30. If you withdraw funds early from a deferred interest account that has a maturity of one year or less, you may have to pay a penalty. You must report the total amount of interest earned as income on your return and do not reduce the in interest income by the amount of penalty you pay for the early withdrawal. Early withdrawal penalties are usually reported on box two of the form 1099 INT. You can claim a full deduction for the early withdrawal penalty as an adjustment to income on line 30 of form 1040, even if the penalty is greater than the interest earned. So here is a 1099 INT, and you can see this box that I circled in red, early withdrawal penalty. If there's a number there, you stick it on line 30. That's it. No special calculations required. This number, box two, <laughs> goes on line 30. Yay. <laughs> Finally, something that's simple. <laughs> yeah, this is not a new deduction, but I, believe it or not, I've had students who did not know about this deduction, which I find rather amazing. Now, of course, the one thing you should be aware about uh, 1099s is they never look like this. So if you have a 1099 INT from a client, it will almost never look like the 1099 INT on the screen in front of you now. The 1099 INT I have on the screen is the IRS's standardized format. If you go to their website and type 1099 INT, this is what they give you. But banks never issue 1099 INTs that look like this. They issue something called a substitute 1099 INT. And uh, the substitute document will say something like box one interest, box two early withdrawal penalty, Box three, U.S. bond interest. Box eight, tax exempt interest. That's how they're, they're written. And they don't have actual boxes. They just say there's a box and then there's a number. So if it says box two, early withdrawal penalty and a number, you put it on line 30. Alimony paid line 31A. 
Now for those of you who have been participating in our entire series, we did talk about alimony just last week when we were talking about income. And so some of this will be a repeat for you, but for those of you who weren't here last week, it's all new. And so we're going to be describing the rules surrounding alimony. And this is in terms of a person claiming alimony as a deduction. You can put everything in reverse when you're looking at alimony as income and whether or not I have to pay tax on this income. But today we're looking at adjustments to income and whether or not a person who pays alimony is allowed to claim a deduction for the alimony paid and how they compute the correct amount of alimony to enter on line 31A. You are allowed to deduct alimony even if you do not itemize your deductions, but if you are claiming alimony as an adjustment to income, you have to file long form 1040. Alimony cannot be claimed as a deduction on short forms EZ or 1040A. You must provide your spouse's social security number on line 31B or a $50 penalty may apply and your deduction could be disallowed. The rules for deducting alimony are the same as the rules for including alimony in your income and you should refer to IRS Publication 17 pages 134 through 136 for more information on the deductibility of alimony payments. So an individual retirement account is a trust or custodial account that is set up in the United States for the exclusive benefit of you or your beneficiaries. The account is created by a written document and the document must show that the account meets all of the following requirements. That the trustee or custodian must be a bank, a federally insured credit union, a savings and loan association, or an entity approved by the IRS to act as a trustee or a custodian. So it's April 14th and your client wants to know how they can reduce their tax bill or increase their refund and you say, yeah, you can go open up an IRA and where do you send them? The most common one I send them to is the bank they're already banking at. So you already have a relationship with this bank, go up to the teller and tell her you want to open up an IRA and she'll put you through whoever they're can help you with that. Also, the trustee or custodian lead generally cannot accept contributions of more than the deductible amount or the deductible amount for the year. However, rollover contributions and employer contributions to a simplified plan or SEP can be more than this amount. Contributions except for rollover contributions must be in the form of cash. You must have a non-forfeitable right to the amount that is in the account at all times. Money in your account cannot be used to buy a life insurance policy. Assets in your account cannot be combined with other property except in a common trust fund or common investment fund. And you must start receiving distributions by April 1st of the year following the year in which you reach age 70 and a half. Originally there was only one kind of IRA. We might remember the olden days when IRA meant IRA and it was very clear because, well, there was only one kind of IRA, but now we have many. So new kinds of IRAs have been created, uh, in particular the Roth IRA and educational IRAs. And while there are tax advantages to investing in Roth and educational IRAs, generally only contributions to a traditional IRA are reported on your tax return. There is an exception in that if you do a conversion from a pension plan or a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, those do get reported on your tax return on Form 8606. And we're going to look at 8606 today. But in general, your client says, yeah, I contributed 3000 to my Roth IRA, what do I do? And you go, you put the money in there, that's it. <laughs> that's very nice. I'm glad you did that. Have a nice day. Uh, then if they say, I put 3000 in my IRA, you're going to say, was it a Roth or a traditional? And if they say Roth, which they usually do, then you do nothing. But if they say traditional, then you perk up because now I've got to do something. Either I'm going to claim a deduction because I put money into traditional IRA or I'm going to fill out a form called 8606 because the deduction is not allowed. Either of those actions have to occur anytime money goes into a traditional IRA. So what is a traditional IRA? Well, I call the traditional IRA the original IRA that was originally approved by the government to allow taxpayers the option of saving for retirement outside of their pension plans. A traditional IRA is any IRA that is not a Roth IRA, simple IRA, or education IRA. In addition, an IRA is not a 401k plan. Earnings generated by money you invest in your IRA are tax deferred. This means you do not pay tax on your earnings until you, uh, until you withdraw them from your IRA. Now I do want to go back up here because remember we said when we were talking about simple IRAs and SEP IRAs that they were traditional IRAs? So the fact that they are SEP IRAs or simple IRAs simply means that the employer has set up a plan to contribute to your traditional IRA for you. But it's 
still a traditional IRA. And it's treated the same as a traditional IRA as far as you're concerned. But of course, if your employer makes contributions to your IRA for you, you do not have a basis in those contributions. So what are some advantages of investing in a traditional IRA? Well, I can remember at the young age of 23, 24, newly married, sitting down with my first investment advisor, and he was really doing a good job of convincing me that a traditional IRA was the best thing on, since sliced bread. And of course, in the years that passed after that, then the Roth IRA came out, and now investment advisors like to sit there and tell you how great Roth IRAs are. But I know, as a tax preparer, I still like traditional IRAs because I like anything that spells tax deduction when I'm filling out a tax form. And Roth IRAs are just some kind of weird thing off in the future that I'm not dealing with today. But when I retire, well, I'm not retiring anytime soon. So for me, a Roth IRA, just I, I can't see it, don't do it. But way back in the olden days, I put money in traditionals. All right, so advantages of investing in a traditional IRA. There are two primary advantages. Firstly, if you qualify, you will be able to deduct contributions you make to your IRA on Form 1040. And generally, the funds you withdraw from your IRA are not taxed until you withdraw them, or the money that is in the IRA is not taxed until you withdraw it. So it's allowed to grow tax-free. So who can make contributions to an IRA? Well, you can set up and make contributions to a traditional IRA if you are under age 70 and a half and you or your spouse, if filing a joint return, had compensation during the year that you must include in your income. So compensation for purposes of an IRA contribution and deduction means that you had earned income from wages, commissions, or self-employment, alimony and separate maintenance payments were received, or you had military differential pay and non-taxable combat pay. You have to have had one of these three forms of income to be treated as having compensation. And the only time you're allowed to put money into an IRA is if you had compensation. Compensation, however, does not include interest, dividends, rental or investment income, pension or annuity income, deferred compensation payments postponed from a prior year, income from a partnership unless you provided services to the partnership that were income producing. In other words, you were self-employed working in your partnership. Conservation reserve program payments reported on Schedule SE or any amounts other than combat pay that you exclude from income, such as foreign earned income and housing costs. Non-taxable combat pay. If you were a member of the US Armed Forces, compensation includes any non-taxable combat pay that you received. The amount should be reported in box 12 if you form W-2 with a code Q. So here is a summary of IRA compensation. Compensation includes wages, salaries, commissions, self-employment income, alimony and separate maintenance income, and military differential pay. Compensation does not include earnings and profits from property, interest and dividend income, pension or annuity income, deferred compensation, or income from certain partnerships. And when we say income from certain partnerships, we mean passive income from a partnership in which you are not actively working and receiving compensation for your services. How much can I contribute to my IRA? You can contribute money, cash, check, or money order to your IRA, and you can contribute the lesser of your compensation that you included in your income, or $5,000 if you were under age 50 in 2011, or $6,000 if you were age 50 or older in 2011. If you contribute to a Roth IRA, you must reduce your allowable contribution to your traditional IRA by the amount that you contributed to your Roth IRA. Married filers. If you are married and file a joint return, you can make an additional spousal uh, contribution that is limited to the lesser of $5,000 if your spouse was under age 50 in 2011, or $6,000 if your spouse was age 50 or older. The total compensation includable and gross income of both spouses for the year. So it's the lesser of those two. And in order to make a contribution for your spouse and a contribution for yourself in the amount of $5,000, your total compensation for the year would have to be at least 10000 If your compensation for the year was only 5000 then the most you could contribute to either your IRA or your spouse's is 5000 or you could split that up between you. When can I make a contribution? You can contribute money to your traditional IRA at any time during the year or by the due date of the return for that year, not excluding extensions. And for 2011, the due date is April 17, 2012. If you are a member of the armed forces serving in a combat zone, 
you have additional time to make your contribution to your IRA. Catch-up contributions in certain employer bankruptcy. The provision for additional catch-up contributions in certain employer bankruptcies that apply to earlier years does not apply for 2010 or later years. How much can I deduct? Your allowable deduction depends on you or your spouse's modified adjusted gross income and whether you are covered by a pension plan at work. Now, here in Oregon, we've had a licensing system in place for pretty much going on 40 years. And that test tests tax preparer knowledge and awards preparers who pass the test with a license. So the IRS is now implementing its own test nationwide. And one of the things I hope that people outside of Oregon might appreciate is my experience on what it is that preparers in Oregon have a difficult time answering correctly on Oregon's test. Because if there's a hist his historical tendency of preparers in Oregon to get a particular type of question wrong on the test, it is likely that preparers in the rest of the country will have similar difficulties when IRS asks similar questions on its test. And what I can tell you is that this particular concept of when I can make a contribution and when can I claim a deduction and how much is that deduction allowed to be confuses people. So uh, preparers miss it on Oregon's exam and they're likely going to be missing it on the federal exam if the federal asks it. Certainly the enrolled agent exam asks it. So here is an example of how the deductions are going to work. Firstly, how much can I deduct? It's based on your modified AGI and whether or not you are covered by an employer plan at work. Let's take a look at Bilbo. He's age 42. He has adjusted gross income of $65,000 and he contributed $3,000 to his Roth IRA during 2011. Bilbo has until April 17, 2012 to contribute a final $2,000 to either his Roth or his traditional accounts. So long as his total combined contributions do not exceed $5,000, it does not matter which account he chooses. He can choose one or the other, but obviously he cannot go over 5000 Modified adjusted gross income. He has to have at least as much income as he contributes. And you look at your modified adjusted gross income by starting on line 37 of Form 1040, and then you add back to your income your IRA deduction, your student loan interest deduction, the tuition and fees deduction, the domestic production activities deduction, the foreign earned income and housing exclusions, exclusion for qualified bond interest, and the exclusion for employer paid adoption expenses. So that's the starting point. You figure out what your modified adjusted gross income is. Then you look to see if you have an employer plan at work. If you don't have an employer plan at work, you're allowed a full deduction, up to the lesser of $5,000 if you are under age 50 or $6,000 if you're age 50 or older, or 100% of your compensation. So the only thing you're concerned about if you don't have a pension plan at work is that you have compensation. And the compensation cannot be less than the amount you contribute. And of course, the amount you contribute cannot be more than 5,000 for under age 50 or 6,000 for age 50 or older. But now it gets confusing. You have a spouse who is covered by a pension plan at work and you are not. If your spouse is covered by a pension plan at work and you are not, your deduction is limited as follows. If you file a joint tax return with your spouse, you can claim a full deduction for yourself if your modified adjusted gross income is $169,000 or less. But if your modified adjusted gross income is greater than $169,000, your deduction begins to phase out. And your deduction is fully phased out when your income hits $179,000. If you are married filing separate, your deduction phases out between zero and $10,000. Now in both cases, you will see that the phase out range is $10,000. So if I have a, a spouse who has a pension plan at work, and I do not, and we both have income, and our income is putting us at $172,000 for the year, what is my IRA deduction going to be if I contribute to a traditional IRA? How much am I allowed to contribute and how much am I allowed to deduct? Compensation-wise, my contribution will not be limited. I can put in the maximum amount based on my age. If I'm under age 50, that would be 5,000, and if I'm age 50 or older, that would be 6,000. How much am I allowed to deduct is a harder question. So I look to the phase-out range here. If the phase-out range is 169 to 179, that is a $10,000 phase-out range. And I look at where is my income in that phase-out range. If my income is 172, how far into the phase-out range am I? 3,000 out of 10,000 into it, or 30% into it. So how much is my deduction going to be limited to? 
30% of the maximum deduction is not going to be allowed because I'm 30% into the phase out. Or you could say 70% is allowed. So I would be allowed to deduct 70% of 5,000 or 70% of 6,000 based on that phase out range. But when my income hits 179, I'm 100% through the phase out range and I'm not allowed a deduction at all. Not to say that I can't put the money in the account. I can still put the full amount in. I just can't claim a deduction. And if I can't claim a deduction, I have to fill out a form to tell the IRS that I couldn't claim a deduction. And that form is 8606. <laughs> now, let's look at another scenario. I am the one that is covered by a pension plan. Forget, um, forget what's happening with myself. I'm only looking at myself right now. I have a pension plan at work. If I am single or head of household, I can claim a full deduction if my modified adjusted gross income is $56,000 or less. My deduction will phase out between $56,000 and $66,000. So again, we have a $10,000 phase out range here, uh, but it's a much lower level of income, $56,000 to $66,000. And if my filing status is married filing joint or married filing or qualifying widower, and I have a pension plan at work, then my phase out is $90,000 to $110,000. It's actually a $20,000 range, isn't it? So the range for married filing joint when I do not have a pension plan at work is a $10,000 range. When I am married and I do have a pension plan at work, I have a $20,000 range, but also that range is at a much lower level of income. So that's just going to affect my formula. If I have $95,000 of income, I would be 25% of my way into that $20,000 spread, wouldn't I? So I'd be allowed 75% of the normal deduction. So it all seems quite simple. Now, these rules are described in two tables that appear in Publication 17 on page 125. They are copied into this manual for your reading pleasure. And uh, we have table number one that says the effect of modified AGI on a deduction if you are covered by a retirement plan at work. So that's the part that throws people for a loop. They have a hard time associating the difference between when I am the one who's covered by a pension plan at work and when I am not the one covered by a pension plan at work, but I have a spouse who is. So let's look first again at I am the one who has a pension plan at work. Then I look to my filing status, single or head of household. I'm allowed a full deduction if my modified AGI is $56,000 or less. If my modified AGI is between 56 and 66, I am allowed a partial deduction. And if my modified AGI is 66,000 or more, I am not allowed a deduction at all. Moving on to married filing joint. I am filing a joint return, and I have a pension plan at work. Then I am allowed a full deduction if my income, modified AGI, is $90,000 or less. If my modified AGI is 90 to 110,000, I am allowed a partial deduction. And as soon as the modified adjusted gross income showing on my married filing joint return exceeds 110,000, I am not allowed a deduction at all. I'm still allowed to put the money in there, I just can't deduct it. So I'm going to have to fill out 8606 to tell the IRS I put money in that I couldn't deduct. Married filing separately. Phase out is $10,000 from 0 to 10000 So a married filing separate filer will never be allowed more than a partial deduction and usually no deduction at all. Now we go on to table number two. Effective modified EGI on your deduction if you are not covered by a retirement plan at work. Firstly, we look at the single status. I am single and I don't have a pension plan at work. I can earn any amount of money and I will be able to take a full deduction. I could have a W-2 that says $30 million in box one and I could claim a full deduction as long as the pension plan box is not checked. Okay, so that's the part that sometimes gets people as well. There's somehow in their mind there's this limit. There's only a limit when you are covered by a pension plan or you are married to someone who is covered by a pension plan. Married filing jointly or separately with a spouse who is not covered by a pension plan. Again, I'm not limited. Married filing jointly with a spouse who is covered by a pension plan at work, then my phase out is going to be 169 to 179. So if my income is 169 or less, I'm allowed a full deduction. 169 to 179, a partial, and more than 179, or 179 or more, no deduction at all. Married filing separately with a spouse who is covered by a pension plan at work, no deduction allowed if my income is over 10000 How to claim the deduction for traditional IRA contributions. 
Figure your allowable deduction using the IRA deduction worksheet, line 32. Claim your allowable deduction as an adjustment to income on line 32 of form 1040, line 17 of 1040A. If your contributions exceed the maximum deductible amount, complete and attach form 8606. So would you like to see how we do that? I have an illustration here. This is David and Jane Pegatty. They are filing a joint return, and Jane is a homemaker, and David earns $188,000 of wages. He is covered by an employer pension plan, and he paid $15,000 of alimony during the year. The Pegatys will each contribute $5,000 to their respective IRAs. What is the amount of their deduction? Without even looking at the form, where does David fall on the wage scale? He's married, and he has a pension plan at work. His income is too high. What is his phase-out range? 90 to 110,000, right? Now, Mary uh, or Jane is not covered by a pension plan at work, and she's married filing a joint return. What's her phase-out range? 169 to 179. So these two individuals are filing a return together, but they have different phase-out ranges. Now, what is their income really? Because we're working off, not off his gross wages, we're working off his modified adjusted gross income. So when we enter in $15,000 as an alimony deduction, where does their income go? Well, it goes down. So now are we still going to have a situation where both of the Pegatys are earning too much money based on their phase out range? Well, the answer is no. That $15,000 alimony deduction is going to throw the income low enough that one of these filers is going to be allowed to claim a deduction. And the question is, how much will that deduction be? Now, if you understand the rules for the worksheet, you simply don't need the worksheet. But I'm going to show you the worksheet anyway. And then I'm going to have you do some examples without a worksheet, because you'll learn more just by thinking about the rules. So the first thing we look at is we have the name David and Jane Pegatty. And then it says, your IRA, that would be David's IRA. And we have Jane, and she's the spouse. So her box is checked. So is David covered by a pension plan? Yes, he is. Is Jane covered? No, she is not. Next it says, enter the phase-out range that applies to you based on whether or not you have a pension plan at work and your filing status. Well, for David, his phase-out range tops out at $110,000 because he is filing a joint return and is covered by a pension plan at work. And for Jane, she's not covered by a pension plan at work, but she has a spouse who is. So she's going to enter 179. Next we go down and we enter the income for the year. The amount of income on line 22 of the 1040, that was total income before adjustments, was 188000 And we're going to subtract out from that the alimony that was paid during the year to arrive at the modified adjusted gross income total of 173000 The MAGI, we call it, modified adjusted gross income or MAGI, is the same for both filers. But how MAGI compares to the phase-out differs. And of course, in the case of David, his modified adjusted gross income is greater than the top end of his phase-out range. So it's safe to say when we get down to line 6A, he's not going to be allowed any number there at all. He gets a negative number, in fact. And in this case, it's left blank. But for Jane, we do a calculation. 173 subtracted from the top end of her phase-out is 6,000. So what that tells you is that her income, if the phase-out is 169 to 179, she's 40% into the phase-out, isn't she? And they have, you, they have you subtract those numbers and get you 6,000. And they're going to do the calculation differently than I do with the phase-out range, because I want you to see how the worksheet works. But ultimately, the phase-out range and the worksheet will get you to the same place. So their point is take the top end of her phase out, subtract out her modified adjusted gross income, and put the difference here on line 6. And you can see in the box here, there's a, I'll zoom in so you can read it better. It says, if married filing jointly or qualifying widow, and the result is $20,000 or more, or $10,000 or more in the column for the IRA of the person who is not covered by a retirement plan at work, enter the applicable amount below on line 7 for that column and go to line 8. And then it's $5,000 if under age 50 and $6,000 if age 50 or older. So let's go on to the next lines and see what happens next. So on line 6A, David is not allowed a deduction. On line 6B, this shows Jane is allowed a partial deduction. 
And if the amount on 6B were $10,000 or more, Jane would be allowed a full deduction. But the amount on line 6B is 6,000, so Jane is allowed a partial deduction. 6,000 is 60% of 10,000, which means Jane will be allowed 60% of the maximum IRA deduction amount. And 60% of 5,000 is $3,000. So without even finishing the worksheet, I already know what her deduction is. And the worksheet just finishes taking us there. So we go over to line 7, and the calculation says married filing jointly or qualifying widow multiply by 25% or by 30% in the column for the IRA of a person who is age 50 or older. But if you check no on either 1A or 1B, then in the column for the IRA of the person who is not covered by a retirement plan, multiply by 50% the amount that appeared on line 6. Well, 50% of 6,000 is 3,000. Seemed to me that using the phase-out range was a whole lot simpler. <laughs> But uh, this worksheet gets you the same place. As I said, math has never been my strong point. I don't necessarily understand where they come up with these equations, but I always figure out my own way how to make them work. Um, I've never really thought about phase-out ranges before. Can I use those all the time? Well, the answer is it depends. <laughs> and the phase-out range application I've just given you for the IRA worksheet is not 100% foolproof. And the reason for that is that uh, if you arrive on a number that is other than a 10, you have to round up to the next $10. So my phase-out range can be off if we're not dealing with perfect round numbers. And in my case, we were dealing with a perfect round number that came to 3,000. But if, if, if manual calculations gave us a deduction of $3,005, then that would actually round up to 3,010. And the worksheet has you do that. So, the mental math or understanding the equation or the formula that goes into a worksheet, I think is fundamental to just understanding tax law as a tax preparer. But sometimes the worksheets are just necessary to make sure you're not missing any steps. Now, some items do have perfectly skewed uh, phase-outs that are always working on a, a formula equal to the phase-out, like the IRA with the exception of the $10 rounding. But others, like the tuition and fees deduction, don't work on phase-out that way at all. When you pass over a certain threshold, it drops by 2,000, and you cross over another threshold, and it's gone entirely. So not all phase-outs work like that, but the IRA does. OK, next we have reporting your non-deductible contributions to your traditional IRA. So the whole point of all of this is to figure that Jane put 5,000 into her IRA, and David put 5000 into his IRA. He's not allowed a deduction at all, and she's allowed only a $3,000 deduction. So both of them will need to attach Forms 8606 to their return. And on David's 8606, he will show a $5,000 increase in the basis of his IRA. And on Jane's tax return, she will show a $2,000 increase to her IRA basis. Because if they both put in five, and she's allowed to deduct three, her basis will go up by two. And he put in five, he's allowed to deduct nothing. His basis will go up by five. Reporting non-deductible contributions to your traditional IRA. If your IRA deduction is limited or not allowed, you have to file 8606 and attach it to your tax return. If you are not required to file a tax return, you must still file 8606 if you made non-deductible contributions to your IRA. So 8606 is one of a small handful of IRS forms that you can actually sign it and mail it in all by itself. And you can either attach it to the tax return or you can sign it and mail it in by itself. Either way, it needs to get filed. Each year, even if you don't make a, co a contribution, your plan is growing or shrinking in size just based on income or losses sub being sustained in the plan. But the 8606 is only filed when you make a non-deductible contribution or you make a distribution from an IRA in which you have a basis. So outside of those years, if you have a year where you put nothing in and you took nothing out, you wouldn't file the form. But internally, sure, the account could be adjusting. Just as you have stocks that are going up and down on the stock market, you could have unrealized gains or losses that are occurring within a plan, but they are of no tax consequence at all until you either cash out of the 401k or IRA or of course, you sell stock on the stock exchange. So IRS is not really interested in what's happening with unrealized gains or losses. It's only wanting to know when you actually put money in or take money out. Now, there are certain acts with relation to an IRA that can cause you to be sustaining a penalty. 
you will be penalized for any of the following acts relating to your traditional IRA. Your IRA invests in collectibles. Sorry, no buying baseball cards or comic book collections with your IRA. You can take an early distribution from your IRA. <laughs> if you do, you'll be paying a penalty. You allow excess amounts to accumulate in your IRA. That causes a penalty. You borrow money from your IRA. Not allowed. You buy property for personal use with IRA funds. You sell property to your IRA. You receive unreasonable compensation for managing your IRA, or you use your IRA as collateral for a loan. All of those will result in penalties. Qualified reservist distributions. A qualified reservist distribution is not subject to the additional tax on early distributions. A distribution you receive is a qualified reservist distribution if the following requirements are met. You were ordered or called to active duty after September 11, 2001. You were ordered or called to active duty for a period of more than 179 days or for an indefinite period because you are a member of a reserve component. The distribution is from an IRA or from amounts attributable to elective deferrals under a Section 401k or 403b plan or a similar arrangement. The distribution was made no earlier than the date of the order or call to active duty and not later than the close of the active duty period. What does reserve component mean? Well, it means you are a member of the Army National Guard or the Army Reserve or the Naval Reserve or the Marine Corps Reserve or the Air National Guard or the Air Force Reserve or the Coast Guard Reserve or Reserve Corps of the Public Health Service. So you take a qualified reservist distribution. Now it's time to make a repayment back. So essentially, you've been called to active duty and you need to take money out of the plan maybe to finance some needs that you have because you were called to active duty and you can take that money out without tax consequence, essentially you're borrowing it and you're supposed to put it back in again. If you are a member of the reserve component and you were ordered or called to active duty after September 11, you may be able to contribute or repay to an IRA amounts equal to any qualified reservist distributions. You can make these repayment contributions even if they would cause your total contributions to the IRA to be more than the general limit on your contributions. So a reservist could repay $20,000 during the year even though 20 is more than the $5,000 limit that they would normally be held to. To be eligible to make these repayments, you must have received a qualified reservist distribution from an IRA or from a Section 401k or 403b plan or a similar arrangement. Your qualified reservist repayments cannot be more than your reservist distributions. You cannot make these repayment contributions later than the date that is two years after your active duty period ends. You cannot deduct qualified reservist payments. The repayment of qualified reservist distributions does not affect the amount you can deduct as an IRA deduction. If you repay a qualified reservist distribution, include the amount of the repayment with non-deductible contributions on line one of form 8606. And here is an illustration. In an earlier year, Barkley, age 46, received a $3,000 qualified reservist distribution which he repaid this year. His basis in all of his traditional SEP simple IRAs on 1231 of 10 was $10,000, and the value of his IRA on 1231 of 11 was $40,000. Barclay's 2011 IRA contribution limit is $5,000. His modified adjusted gross income is $59,000. Barclay figures his allowable IRA deduction for 2011 as follows. Firstly, he looks to his modified adjusted gross income phase-out range. For a single filer, that's $56,000 to $66,000. Is he in the range? Yes, he is. Barclay's modified adjusted gross income of $59,000 is $3,000 or 30% of the way into that phase-out range. So his allowable IRA deduction is going to be 30% times $50,000, and he's going to be left with $3,500. His deduction is actually going to be 60% of the max. He will not be allowed 30%. Barclay will claim an IRA deduction of $3,500 on line 32 of his Form 1040, and the balance for $1,500 is going to be a non-deductible contribution that he enters on his Form 8606. For 2011, Barclay can contribute a total of $8,000 to his IRA, and his contribution is figured as follows. The deductible contribution of $3,500 plus the non-deductible contribution of $1,500 and the qualified reservist repayment of $3,000. Since Barclay is making a non-deductible contribution of $1,500 and a qualified reservist payment of $3,000, he must file Form 8606 with his return and include $4,500 um, on line one of Form 8606. The qualified reservist repayment is not deductible. So here we have his form. We enter his non-deductible contributions. 
we enter his total basis, and we add those in, his basically boosting his basis back up. So 8606 tracks non-deductible contributions. It tracks partially taxable distributions. And there's a formula that's used to figure out if he does take a distribution, how much of it is taxable. And we discussed that formula in our last class on pension and social security income. This class, we're only looking at how you fill out the form when you put money in. And in this situation, he puts in non-deductible amounts totaling $4,500. But let's finish up on the topic of um, individual um, IRAs the traditional IRA, and then we'll do a quick classwork assignment, and then we'll finish for more discussion on IRAs in the final um, topics of the day. So we're back up here at the top of the page with basis of inherited IRAs. Now one of the things that happens in tax law is that when a person dies, their estate, the assets that are held by their estate after they die, get something referred to as stepped up basis. But stepped up basis rules do not apply to pension plans or IRAs. And so typically the decedent's basis, if they have one, will continue through to the beneficiary. And very often no one knows what that basis was, so we assume there's no basis at all. IRS is of the opinion if you can't show that there was a basis, they allow zero basis. But it is technically possible to have a basis in an inherited IRA. If you inherit a traditional IRA from a person who had a basis, because he or she made non-deductible contributions, the basis in your inherited IRA is the same as the basis generated by the person who created it before they died. There are some additional rules to be aware of with regards to inherited IRAs. Firstly, we have rules for the spouse of a decedent. If you are the decedent's spouse, you can choose to treat the IRA you inherit as a separate inherited IRA, or you can treat it as your own IRA. If you roll the funds over to your own IRA, you can combine the basis of your spouse's IRAs with the basis of your own IRAs. If you choose to treat your spouse's IRA as your own IRA, you cannot take distributions from the IRA until you reach age 59 and a half. If you do not roll the IRA over or elect to be treated as the owner, you can take distributions from the plan before you reach age 59 and a half. Inherited IRAs, these are rules for non-spouse beneficiaries. If you've inherited an IRA but you are not the spouse of the decedent, then you have different rules that apply. You can take distributions from both an inherited IRA and your IRA, and each has basis, um, but you have to complete separate form 8606. So a, a spouse who inherits an IRA can choose to treat her IRA and her spouse's IRAs as all one and the same and file a single 8606. But a person other than a spouse cannot make that election and would have to track the basis in the inherited IRA separately from the basis in their own IRA. And any time a cash out happens, they have to pay attention to what IRA it was and file a separate 8606 for each type. The 10% early distribution tax does not apply to distributions from inherited IRAs. You cannot make contributions to an inherited IRA. And you can make a trustee to trustee transfer of the inherited IRA to a newly created inherited IRA with a different financial institution. So the next topic after this is Roth, but before we do Roth, I wanted to return to the topic that we were on before our break, uh, which was figuring the deductible portion of an IRA contribution, and for that I have a classwork assignment. It is now time to complete classwork assignment number one for session seven. Please flip to page 41 of your session seven student manual to take a look at classwork assignment number one with me. Classwork assignment number one says, unless otherwise indicated, none of the following taxpayers is an active participant in an employer-maintained retirement plan. What is the maximum amount the following individuals may contribute to their IRA and claim a deduction for on their tax returns? So your job at this point is to read through each of these assignment questions. There's question one through seven. So your job at this point is to read each problem, number one through seven, and determine how much this individual should contribute to their plan and claim a deduction for. What is the maximum amount they can contribute and deduct on their returns? So let's take a look first at problem number one. Vicki Jones is single. She earned $1,200 in wages and $6,000 in interest. Her allowable IRA deduction is blank. 
So her allowable IRA deduction is going to be limited to her income, her earned income, or her compensation for the year. Her compensation for the year is only $1,200. Therefore, the maximum amount she can both contribute and deduct is $1,200. At this point, please push pause on video playback, complete questions 2 through 7 of Classwork Assignment number 1. When you are ready, resume video playback for a review of the Classwork 1 answer key. It is now time to review Classwork Assignment number 1 for Session 7. We're going to begin by looking at question number 2. I have the answer key here on the left side of the screen, and the Classwork Assignment itself is on the right-hand side of the screen. You should be following along with me in your student manual. Question number 2 reads, Frank Ford is a married man aged 51. His wife Betty, age 52, is an active participant in her company's retirement plan. Fred earned 45000 and Betty earned 50000 What is Frank's allowable IRA deduction? Well, we have to look at the rules here. Firstly, what is the phase-out amount for a person who is married and is not an active participant in a company plan but has a spouse who is an active participant in their plan? So to do that, we need to look at the tables. So we flip to Pub 17, page 126, and find table 17.2, effect of modified AGI on deduction if you are not covered by a retirement plan at work. Frank is not covered by a retirement plan at work, but his wife Betty is. So we move over to the married filing jointly with a spouse who is covered by a pension plan at work. If your modified adjusted gross income is $169,000 or less, you are allowed a full deduction. Well, let's see what Frank and Betty's combined income is. Frank is a married man, age 51. His wife, Betty, is age 52. Her income is 50. His income is 45. If you add those numbers together, you get 95,000. 95,000 is less than 169,000. That means Frank's ability to claim a deduction for his IRA contribution will not be limited. The next question is, how much is he allowed to contribute? The amount that he is allowed to contribute is based upon his age. He is age 50 or older, so his maximum contribution amount is 6000 and the maximum amount he will be allowed to deduct is also $6,000. Let's take a look at question number three next. Referring to problem number two, what is Betty's allowable IRA deduction? Well, now we need to go back to Pub 17 and look at the other table. Let's scroll up and take a look at that. And here we have table 17-1, effect of modified AGI on deduction if you are covered by a retirement plan at work. Well, Betty is covered by a retirement plan at work, and she is married filing jointly. So we go over to the married filing jointly section, and it says, if your income is $90,000 or less, you are allowed a full deduction. Well, their income is $95,000, so Betty will only be allowed a partial deduction. What is her allowable deduction? Well, we have to look at her phase-out range. The phase-out range for a married person filing a joint return is ninety to $110,000. That means that the phase-out range is $20,000, and that puts her $5,000, or 5 twentieths of the way into her phase-out range. So we take 5 twentieths, or that would be 25% of $6,000. $1,500 of the maximum allowable contribution of $6,000 is not deductible. So $6,000 minus $1,500 is $4,500. That means $4,500 is the maximum allowable contribution that Mary can deduct. If she contributes more than $4,500 to her IRA, she will need to attach Form 8606 to report her non-deductible contributions. Next question is question number four. Jerry is single and age 50. His AGI is $25,000, all of it from his share of income in his partnership. 
Jerry's Schedule SE reported $25,000 of self-employment income. What is Jerry's maximum traditional IRA contribution and deduction? Well, in answering this question, he's not covered by a pension plan at work. Since he's not covered by a pension plan at work, his contribution is only going to be limited by his income and his age. Well, he's age 50, so the maximum possible contribution is $6,000. His income is greater than $6,000. His compensation income is greater than six. Therefore, six is the amount he is allowed to put in and deduct. Number five, Sally, age 45, is divorced. She received $50,000 of alimony during the year. It was her only source of income. What is her allowable IRA deduction? Well, alimony is considered to be a form of compensation. This means Sally can contribute money to her IRA. Her compensation is greater than $5,000. It's greater than $6,000. After all, it's $45,000. So her her contribution is not going to be limited by her income, only by her age. And in this case, because she is under age 50, her maximum allowable contribution is $5,000. And $5,000 is also the maximum amount that she can deduct. So we see here in the answer key, $5,000 is the correct answer. Sally, age 45, is allowed a maximum contribution of five. She is also allowed a full deduction of the five if she puts five in. Question number six, Jack, age 49, and Mary, age 51, are married. Jack works full-time at XYZ, Inc., and he earned $150,000. He is eligible to participate in his company's 401k plan, but did not make any contributions to the plan during the year. The Sanders modified AGI for the year is $158,000, and Mary did not work. What is Jack's maximum IRA contribution? Well, let's take a look at the answer key here. Jack, age 49, has modified adjusted gross income greater than 110000 and he is covered by a pension plan at work. His decision to not participate in his employer's plan does not affect the income phase-out uh, deductibility for his IRA contribution. In other words, you can't just say, well, since I'm not participating by choice, then I can put a full amount into my IRA. It doesn't work that way. If you are eligible to participate in a company plan but choose not to, you are still considered to be covered by that employer plan. And how do you know if a person is covered by an employer plan? Well, you look to the employer plan box checked on the W-2 or pension plan box that is checked on the W-2. If that box is checked, the IRS knows they're eligible to participate in a plan and you cannot give that filer an IRA deduction if their income exceeds the phase-out amount as shown on the tables in Pub 17. So, based on his age, Jack can contribute up to $5,000 to his IRA, but he is not allowed to claim a deduction at all. Let's go back to the table in Pub 17. Effect of modified AGI if you are covered by a retirement plan at work. The married filing joint filing status shows that the income phases out completely when the income is $110,000 or more. He gets no deduction, and we can see in the wording of the problem here that we said that the income is $150,000. He is he's just blown away that phase out. He's completely out of it and is not allowed to claim a deduction at all. So he would need to complete Form 8606 to report his non-deductible contributions. Next up, the last question in line is question number seven, and we are this time also taking a look at the information provided in problem number six, but now we're taking a look at Mary. She is age 51. She does not work. She is not covered by a pension plan at work, um, but she is married to someone who does. How much is she going to be allowed to deduct if she puts money into her IRA? Well, Mary, as I said, is not covered by a pension plan at work. She is married filing joint, and her phase-out range, according to the table in Pub 17, is $169,000 to $179,000. And we can see here that we have married filing joint with a spouse who is covered by a pension plan at work. If the income is more than $169,000 but less than $179,000, the filer is allowed a partial deduction. Well, where is the income for this family? The income is $158,000. That is less than the phase-out range of 169. So ultimately, Mary will be allowed a full contribution and deduction. She can contribute up to $6,000 because she is age 50 or older, and she is allowed a full deduction of $6,000. So that concludes the review of the Session 7 Classwork 1 Answer Key. Let's now continue with the lecture. Roth IRAs. And that's at the bottom of page 49 for those of you who are flipping through papers. 
Roth, uh, rules for Roth IRAs and traditional IRAs are the same in many ways, but there are exceptions as follows. Number one, there is no age limit for contributing to a Roth IRA. You can contribute at any age. No deduction is allowed for what you put into a Roth. You do not report Roth contributions on your tax return in most cases. Income limit, uh, limits apply to Roth. Your allowable contribution phases out when your income is between $107,000 and $122,000 for single, head of household, or married filing separately if you did not live with your spouse at any time during the year. $169 to $179 for married filing joint and qualifying widow, and zero and $10,000 if you file separately but you lived with your spouse at any time during the year. You are not required to take a distribution from a Roth when you reach age 70 and a half, and qualified distributions from your Roth are not taxable. To be qualified, a distribution is one that occurs five years after the first year in which you make a contribution and that is made on or after the date you reach age 59 and a half, or because you were disabled, or to a beneficiary of your estate after your death, or to pay certain qualified first-time home buyer amounts. It is possible to convert a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, and for that matter, it is now also possible to um, convert 401k plan money into a Roth IRA. Either of those activities will cause you to need to file Form 8606. So typically, contributions to a Roth IRA are not reported on their tax return, and the exception is when you do conversions from traditional IRAs or pension plans into Roth IRAs. You can convert amounts from either a traditional SEP or simple IRA to a Roth, and these conversions are treated as a rollover, regardless of the conversion method used. You may also roll over eligible distributions from qualified retirement plans to a Roth IRA, and this rule has now been around for a few years. Prior to 2008, you could only do rollovers from traditional IRAs or other kinds of IRA, IRA accounts into Roth. Um, you could not do, not do rollovers from pension plans, but since 2008, it's now been possible to do it from any type of pension plan to a Roth. Now, there is a new rule that took play in 2010. And we observed that, just on the earlier page, that I was telling you that your ability to contribute to a Roth uh, ends when your income goes too high. Regardless of whether you have a pension plan at work, it isn't tied to that at all. It's just tied to income. If you earn too much, you cannot contribute to a Roth. But beginning in 2010, you can have any amount of income and roll over to a Roth. So this is one of those things where I'm not quite sure why the government's doing it this way. I can remember when the Roth accounts first came out, there was this man named Senator Roth, and he got it named after him, so he must have felt really happy about it on that day. That's why they're called Roth IRAs, but he's been out of office for a while now. Anyway, this was back in 1998. It was a landmark year, 1998. All kinds of new laws came into being back then, including the Roth accounts. That was when we had the um, education credits came into being. All kinds of stuff happened back in 1998. Yeah, child tax credit. It was a landmark year in the tax preparation industry. And at that time, the rule for a Roth was you had to have income low enough to contribute to it. And the only way you could get money into it was a direct contribution or you could roll over from a traditional if you wanted to do that. And if you wanted to roll over from a pension plan, you had to roll the pension plan into the traditional and then the traditional into the Roth. But the rollovers were still only allowed if your income was below a certain threshold. So all in all, it, the account was really intended for people who don't make too much. But in 2010, they removed the income rule for rollovers. So now I'm not exactly quite sure why they have a limit on the income to make a direct contribution, but no limit on your income when you can roll over. So obviously, you can backdoor your way into this now. You can open up a Roth account, and then you roll money from your pension plan into the Roth account or your IRA into your Roth account, regardless of your income. So I don't know why they just don't let you put it in in the first place anymore, but I'm not a politician. so. Anyway, <laughs> so yeah, if you do a conversion from a traditional IRA to a Roth or from your pension plan to a Roth, that is going to create a taxable event. For 2010 only, um, the tax can be spread over two years. Normally, you would do a rollover from your traditional IRA to a Roth and you report it in income in the year that that happens. You would file Form 8606 
to report that. Uh, but if you did the conversion in 2010, you can spread it out over two years, and the income is reported equally in 11 and 12, subject to some exceptions, all of which we covered in our class on pensions. And they did, this is not the first time they had a rule like that. Back in 1998, when they first created the Roth, you could roll over from a traditional to a Roth at that time, and they gave you four years to spread it out. But 2010 was the next one, and now, uh, of course, all conversions in 2011 or future years are reported in full in the year of the conversion. It is now time to complete classwork assignment number two. Please flip to page 42 of your session seven student manual, and let's take a look at the classwork assignment number two on that page. Under this assignment, we need to determine the maximum contribution for a Roth IRA for the following taxpayers. And I'll do number one with you, and then you can push pause and do the rest on your own. Todd, aged 50, Acres, is married to Martha, age 49. Martha earned $40,000 working for ABC Company. Todd earned $120,000 working for Intel. They received $20,000 of taxable interest and $1,500 of non-taxable interest. They made no traditional IRA contributions. So what is the maximum amount that they can tr contribute to their Roth IRA? So let's open up the answer key and take a look at this. So the rules for Roth IRAs are that if your modified adjusted gross income as a married couple is greater than 179000 you are not allowed to make a Roth contribution at all. So what that means is that the acres are not allowed to put anything into a Roth IRA. They would only be allowed to contribute to a traditional IRA. So at this point, please push pause on video playback, complete questions two through four of classwork assignment number two. When you are ready, resume video playback for a review of the classwork two answer key for session seven. So I have now on the screen in front of you Pub 17. I have flipped to page 133 for the table on the phase-out amounts for ability to contribute to a Roth IRA based on marital status and income. And for the acres, in question number one, if the income is less than 169000 you are allowed a full contribution. If your income is between 169 and 179 you are allowed a partial contribution. And if your income exceeds 179 you are not allowed to make a contribution at all. And of course, for the acres, we have 40 plus 120, that's 160, plus another 20 is 180. Um, we're over. And, and so they're done. Then question number two says, if Todd and Martha file married filing separate, what would their allowable Roth contribution be? Well, we go over to married filing separately. If the income is $10,000 or more, you cannot contribute to a Roth IRA. So there's your answer. Number two, if they file married filing separate, the phase-out range for contributing to a Roth is zero to 10,000. Both Todd and Martha separately have income exceeding this amount. They are not allowed to contribute to a Roth IRA. The next question in line is question number three. Jake Edwards, age 35, is married filing separate, but did not live with his spouse at any time during the year. He earned 85000 and he contributed $1,000 to his traditional IRA. What is his maximum Roth contribution? Well, the maximum Roth contribution for a person age under 50 is $5,000, but you have to reduce that amount by any amount placed into a traditional IRA during the year. And since Jake put $1,000 into his traditional IRA, that means the maximum amount he could contribute to his Roth for the year is going to be another $4,000. So we then look to see if his ability to contribute to the Roth will be phased out by his income. So we go over to the table in Pub 17. We look at single, head of household, or married filing separately and did not live with your spouse at any time during the year. If the income is less than $1,000, the maximum contribution is up to $5,000. We reduce $5,000 by $1,000. That means the correct answer for question number three is $4,000. So taking a look at the answer key, question number three, since Jake is married filing separate and did not live with his wife at any time during the year, he is allowed to contribute to a Roth IRA because his income is less than 107000 to the 122000 phase-out range. When you are under age 50, the maximum combined allowable contributions to traditionals plus Roth is 5000 And since Jake has already contributed 1000 to his traditional, he is allowed to contribute 4000 to his Roth. He is under age 50. So 4000 is the correct answer to question number three.
And question number four, Tasma is age 35. Her husband, Harry, is age 30. They are married. Their modified AGI is 171000 on their joint return. What is their maximum Roth contribution? So we go over married filing jointly. Is the income less than 169? No, it's not. And it's not 179. They're in the phase out range. The phase out range is $10,000. How far into that range are they? They are 2000 into a $10,000 range. That means they're going to be allowed 80% of the maximum normal contribution. The answer key shows us that 20% is not going to be uh, allowed as a contribution. They are allowed to contribute 80% of the maximum amount for their age. And since they are both under age 50, their maximum contribution amount is $5,000. 5,000 times 80% is 4,000. So both Harry and Tasma are limited to making maximum contributions of $4,000 each to their Roth IRAs. That concludes the review of the Classwork 2 Answer Key for Session 7. Let's continue with the Session 7 lecture. Coverdell Education Savings Account, or ESA. An ESA is a trust or custodial account created to pay the qualified higher education expenses of the beneficiary who is under the age of 18 or is a special needs beneficiary. Amounts in the account grow tax-free until they are distributed and the following rules apply. The account must be organized in the United States and be designated as a Coverdell ESA when it is created. And in, any individual can contribute money to a Coverdell ESA. However, the amount contributed to any one beneficiary during the year cannot be more than $2,000. The amount you can contribute phases out when your modified adjusted gross income exceeds these amounts. So if you're single or married filing separate, you can open up and contribute money to an ESA for a beneficiary as long as your income is less than 95000 or your amount to contribute will phase out as your income rises. And for married filing joint, you take those amounts and double them. The distributions that you pull out of an ESA can be used to pay qualified education expenses of the beneficiary, and if they are, they're tax-free. Qualified expenses include elementary, secondary, undergraduate, and graduate level studies. This is one of the things that got me. Most of the time when we think about education expenses, they're higher education or they're for child care to enable you to go to work. Whoever thought that you could take money from anywhere in the IRS code and use it to pay for a private school? But this is the one place where it can happen. So if you opened up a Coverdell ESA account for, say, your grandchild, and that money is built up to $10,000, uh, that money could be spent to send your child to a private school. Really, the Coverdell ESA was originally created, I think, with college in mind, but it, it's, there's this little rule here that does allow it to be spent on other than college as long as it's spent on education. A 10% additional tax will apply to distributions that are greater than the qualified educational expenses of the beneficiary. You can roll over assets from the beneficiary's Coverdell ESA to the Coverdell ESA of certain family members. Generally, assets remaining must be distributed when the beneficiary dies, reaches age 30, um, and the due date for contributions to an ESA is the due date for filing your return, not including extensions. Now, one of the things that goes on, well, almost no one opens these. Um, that's the first thing in all the years I've been doing taxes. I think I've got one client who's ever come to me, and she used the money to pay for private school, <laughs> not for college. There's another kind of, re of uh, investment savings account that pays for students' education, and that's the 529 plans the college savings plans that are set up at the state level. And those are really a much better deal. They don't have limits on how much you can put into them other than you can't put more than the reasonable expected cost of the education. And so most of the clients I deal with, at least here in Oregon, are investing in 529 plans. I don't have clients who are doing these ESAs. And really, when the ESA first came out, it had a $500 limit. It's all the way up to $2,000 at this point, but even so, it, you'd have to be very disciplined as a taxpayer every year investing to save enough to pay for your kid's college, whereas the 529 plans, you're allowed to put a lot more in. Student loan interest. We're on to the next line of the tax return. So even though we talked about Roth IRAs and we talked about education IRAs, the only reason I threw those in is, well, we were talking about IRAs. They don't have lines or entries typically on the tax return when you make contributions to them. But we're on to the next line of Form 1040, and this line is the student loan interest line. This is another one of the provisions that is due to sunset. But you may be able to deduct interest you paid on a qualified student loan. This deduction is available whether or not the education is work-related. To qualify, 
or if you qualify, you can deduct up to $2,500 of student loan interest paid in 2010. And if you qualify, you deduct it on Form 1040. You can also claim it on the short Form 1040A, but you entered on Line 18. This provision was set to expire at the end of 2010. The Reed-McConnell Tax Relief Act extended it through 2012. So 2012 is the last year this deduction is available unless it is extended. P to be deductible, the interest on a student loan must meet certain criteria, including the student loan interest must be paid for an eligible student who was yourself, your spouse, or any individual who was your dependent at the time the debt was incurred. The taxpayer claiming the deduction must have the primary obligation to repay the loan and actually pay the interest during the year. An eligible student must take at least one half of the normal full-time load in a degree, certificate, or other qualified program at an eligible institution. The interest must be on a loan used to pay for tuition fees, room and board, books, equipment, and transportation while attending an eligible institution. So when we talk about education credits, the cost of education for purposes of claiming an education credit would never include room and board. Not allowed. But when we're looking at whether or not the cost of room and board is an education expense, the IRS says, yes, it is. It's just not a deductible expense or an expense eligible for a credit. But if you paid for a room and board as a cost of attending a, an educational institution and you took out a student loan to help you pay for the cost of living, then you're going to be able to deduct that cost. And not deduct the cost, but you can be able to deduct interest on loans that helped cover that cost. Make sense? An eligible educational institution includes colleges, vocational schools, or other post-secondary institutions that are eligible to participate in the Department of Education student aid programs. But the deduction phases out when your modified adjusted gross income is between 120 and 150 if filing joint, zero if separate, or 60 to 75 thousand dollars if single. Those are relatively low phase outs. If you live in a higher cost city, um, you're going to have a lot of clients who are phased out all the time. One of the things that happens when you go to college and you get a degree and then you start working and paying on your student loan is you typically get a good job that pays more than this, especially if you live in a high cost area. If you live in moderate uh, cost areas of the country, you may find lots of clients with college educations are able to claim this deduction. But high cost areas of the country like New York City, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, Portland, Oregon, um, we find a lot of our clients in Portland, Oregon even are phased out and don't get this. Now you do have to look at your modified adjusted gross income when you're figuring your income and modified adjusted gross income includes income excluded on Form 2555 for the foreign earned income exclusion as well as income excluded for residents of American Samoa and Puerto Rico. Restrictions, you are not allowed to claim a deduction for your student loan interest expense if any of the following is true. Number one, you were claimed as a dependent on another person's return. Number two, your filing status is married filing separate. Or number three, the loan was made under a qualified employer plan. There is a problem with the student loan interest deduction beyond the phase out limits if you earn too much. And that is that the student loan interest will not be deductible when a parent claims a student as a dependent if that dependent has the primary obligation to repay the loan. If the dependent is claimed on the parent's return, then he or she will not be able to claim the deduction either. So you have to look at who has the primary obligation to repay the loan. And so when you're seeing a student loan interest document being issued, and that document is a 1098E, your client should have a 1098E to indicate the amount of student loan interest they paid for the year, you'd be looking for the taxpayer's social security number on that 1098E. If it's not there, then the alarm bell should be ringing. Whose loan is this? Who has the obligation to repay the loan? And if it's the dependent, the parent can't be claiming interest that is in the dependent's name. If the parent co-signed and they have an, a primary obligation to repay the loan, then they should be able to claim it. But you should expect a letter from IRS that the 1098E does not have their number on it. We're moving right along and getting close to the end here. Tuition and fees deduction, line 34. This is an, a deduction that has expired as of the end of 2011. And unless it is extended for 2012, it is not available for 2012 filers. You can claim a deduction of up to $4,000 for qualified tuition and related expenses at an eligible educational institution. These expenses can be paid for you, your spouse, or your dependent. Qualified higher education expenses include amounts that are paid to, for tuition and fees only as a condition of enrollment. 
Um, for example, Jane enrolls in a course at her local community college, and she paid the following expenses. She paid tuition of $150, a program fee of $20, books purchased at the college bookstore, and a parking permit. Her total cost of attending the educational institution and completing that course was $245, but only the $150 and the program fee are deductible as a tuition expense because they are paid directly to the institution as a condition of enrollment. You don't have to pay a per parking permit as a condition of enrollment, and the books were not required as a condition of enrollment. If they were, they would, should have been included in the cost of the course. Jane is required to pay $170 for tuition and program fees prior to enrollment. Uh, required reading for the course includes books Jane has to purchase, but um, she could purchase the used ones or borrow them. There's other options out there. Example number two, Sally enrolls in a basic tax course offered through a licensed vocational school. She must pay the following expenses directly to the school as a condition of enrollment. Tuition of $320, an enrollment fee of $29, and books and supplies all included in one package deal. She can't pay only $329 and avoid the books. She has to buy the books as a condition of enrollment. And because she has to, she can claim the full cost, $569. The tuition must have been paid for you, your spouse, or a person whom you are claiming on your return. Tuition expenses are deductible if they are paid by you, your spouse, your parent, or by another person on your behalf, or through proceeds from student loans or financial aid programs, so long as the amounts borrowed must be repaid at some point in the future. Tuition expenses are not deductible if they were paid by your employer or through a scholarship or grant that you are not required to repay. So one of the things I use to describe the tuition and fees deduction, and it's the same thing with the education credits, is that the deduction or the credit follows the exemption. Whoever claims the exemption gets the credit without regard to who paid the expense. So if a student paid his or her own expense and that student is a dependent of the parent and the parent is claiming that student as a dependent, then the parent claims the credit even if the student paid the expense. And if grandma and grandpa paid the education expense for their grandchild, the parents of the grandchild who claim that child as a dependent are the ones who are entitled to the credit. This is something that really escapes a lot of tax preparers, but it also escapes clients. When I ask clients, did you have any educational expenses during the year, they'll answer no, even though they had a, a child enrolled in college full time. So that's a bad way to word the question. A good way to wor word the question is, were you or any of your children enrolled in college this year? It doesn't leave them an opportunity to decide why that information is important. Either it's yes, they were in college, or no, they weren't in college. And if yes, they were in college, OK, how much was the college? Well, we didn't pay for it. It doesn't matter. How much was it? <laughs> Tell me how much it was. <laughs> well, I don't know. My kid gets that document. I don't know where he lost it. OK, well, have your kid log on and get another copy. Most of these 1098Ts, as they're called, can be downloaded these days. Or you can go over to the university and ask them to give you another printout. Now, payment for tuition and fees must have been made during 2011 for education that began in 2011 or in the first three months of 2012. So the tuition deduction is claimed in the year you pay the expense. And the expense must be for the same year in which it was paid unless you made a 2011 payment for the winter term that basically began in January 2012. The tuition must have been paid to an eligible institution, and an eligible institution is any college, university, vocational school, or other post-secondary educational institution that is eligible to participate in a student aid program administered by the US Department of Education. Certain educational institutions located outside of the United States also participate in the US Department of Education's federal student aid programs, and they would also qualify then. And session seven, password number three is Jefferson. J-E-F-F-E-R-S-O-N. But what does not qualify? Well, you cannot claim a deduction for any of the following. Insurance, medical expenses, room and board, transportation, personal living or family expenses, expenses paid by your employer or reimbursed by your employer, Expenses paid by tax-free educational assistance from sources such as scholarships, Pell Grants, and Veterans Educational Assistance. You may not claim the deduction for expenses that were not in excess of interest from US savings bonds used to pay for our education or tax-free distributions from a covered ESA. Well, a tax-free distribution from a covered ESA, we would be looking at your income from that distribution. 
you invested 2000 into the Coverdell ESA and you took out 2500 and you emptied it when you did take out 2500 it means the growth was 500 so the first $500 would not be allowed as an education expense because you distributed it tax free or tax free distributions from a qualified tuition savings plan that is one of those 529 plans set up at the state level or uh, book supplies and equipment that are not deductible they are not deductible unless the cost of these items is paid directly to the institution as a condition of enrollment. So this is a very restrictive definition. It actually is the same definition that attaches to the lifetime learning credit and used to attach to the HOPE credit when we had a HOPE credit. But it is a much more strict definition than what we use to define qualifying expenses for the American Opportunity Credit. You cannot claim the educational expense deduction if your status is married filing separate. Another person claims your exemption on their return. You file Form 1040NR. Your modified adjusted gross income is more than 80000 or 160 if you're filing joint. Or you are claiming the American Opportunity or Lifetime Learning Credits for expenses of the same student you are using to claim this deduction. And here's an illustration. Robin Loxley has two sons, John and Will. Qualified tuition paid for John totaled $4,000. Will's tuition was $5,000. Robin could claim an educational expense deduction for either child. However, if he claims a $4,000 deduction for John, he cannot also claim an education credit for John. And we'll cover education credits later in our 1040 series when we get to federal tax credits for individuals. Now, the tuition and fees deduction has been around for a while. And when it first came out, we did actually have a phase-out range that applies to it where you, you actually looked at percentages. But ever since 2004, it's been a two-phase uh, phase out. And the first phase is if your income is between zero and 65,000, um, you're allowed a $4,000 deduction, a maximum of 4,000 if you had that much in expense. And if your income hits $65,001, it drops to 2,000, just like that. That $1 difference in income causes you to lose $2,000 of deduction. And then when your income hits, 80,000, you're still allowed 2,000, but if your income hits 80,000 and one dollars, you're not allowed a deduction at all. And you take those limits and apply the, and double them for married filing joint. So you claim the deduction by filing form 8917. In the early years when this deduction first came into being, they didn't have a form for it, and it was causing some confusion because filers would have the education credit that they were claiming on Form 8863, and then they'd claim a tuition and fees deduction on the front of 1040, and IRS would send letters saying you can't do both. And the answer is you can do both, just not for the same student. So they created a form simply to identify the student being claimed for the deduction to ensure that the name and Social Security number of the student on the form is not also being claimed on Form 8863. So it's a kind of a no-brainer form. Put the name of the student, the social security number of the student, the qualified expense played, uh, follow the, uh, apply the phase-out threshold, and figure your deduction. In this case, there is no phase-out affecting the student, so the full deduction is allowed of 4,000. Now, there's one more line left on the 1040 under adjustments. Did you know that? Line 36? It's this dotted line, and guess what? You can hand write in other adjustments on the dotted line. The first adjustment that you can enter on the dotted line is an adjustment for Archer MSA contributions. So uh, we talked about the health savings account, but there are other kinds of health savings account, including the original, which was the Archer MSA. And if you made contributions to an Archer MSA, you would fill out the form associated with that uh, contribution and then enter the amount on line 36. And on the dotted line next to line 36, you would type MSA. You're also allowed to claim a deduction on line 36 if you've paid jury, if you made jury pay and included the jury pay in your income, but then you were required to pay the jury pay to your employer because your employer paid you while you were on jury duty. So you've got, been called in for jury duty, you're required to go, and uh, while you're there, you're not working for your employer. And your employer may have a policy that they'll pay you for jury time you spend on jury pay. So if they pay you for your jury pay, they may say, well, you need to give us your jury pay. All $5 of it. Well, in my illustration here, the jury pay is $200. And the jury pay has been paid to the employer. So the employee reports the jury pay on line 21. And then on line 36, on the dotted line, you type jury pay, $200, and carry that over as an adjustment. The next item is personal property rental. 
If you received income from the rental of personal property and you were not in the business of renting personal property, enter the amount of income you received on Form 1040, Line 21, as other income. And here you can see we typed personal property rental. And in this case, we said it was $4,000. And then on uh, Line 36, you can claim a deduction for expenses related to the personal property rental. I'm trying to think of an example of what might qualify. I think horses all the time because I like horses. And before I had a horse trailer, I used to eye other people's horse trailers. So maybe I have a need for a horse trailer and I go over to my neighbor and say, I'll give you 100 bucks if you'll rent me your horse trailer for the, the day or for two weeks or whatever. Well, technically, that would be a rental of personal property that that person should report on their return. And then if there was a, an expense that could be associated with that, they would be able to deduct it. So that was just something that comes to my mind. Might rent out your RV. That would be another one. Reforestation, if you have a reforestation expense, um, you need to read the instructions in publication 535. And if you qualify, you enter the expense on line 36 and type RFFT. Subpay TRA, this is a spe very specialized, unique form of unemployment benefit. If you qualify uh, to receive it and then you had to repay it, you claim the a deduction on the line. UDC is legal expenses from an unlawful discrimination claim. If you paid attorney fees for actions settled or decided after October 2, 22, 2004 involving certain unlawful discrimination claims, you can deduct these expenses on line 36 to the extent of gross income received from the action. Now, most attorney fees are deductible on Schedule A. So if you receive a settlement from a lawsuit, typically you include that lawsuit in your income. And if you have legal expenses associated with that lawsuit, those expenses are reported on Schedule A subject to a 2% limit. So it's kind of not a good deal. But if you can show you won a legal dispute over an unlawful discrimination claim, you have an above the line deduction that can be claimed. And the last item of the day is WFB. If you paid attorney fees or court costs in connection with an award from the IRS for information leading to the detection of tax law violations, you may be eligible for this deduction. So is that an incentive for us tax repairers to snitch on the cheaters? I don't know. Is there like an ethics violation if we snitch on a cheater who was our client? So, <laughs> so that concludes the Session 7 lecture. It's now time to take a look at our final assignment for Session 7, that is classwork assignment. Uh, this one involves preparation of tax returns. And the forms needed to complete Problem 3 are 1040, 3903, which is the moving expense form, 8606, which is the non-deductible IRA contribution form, 8917, which is the tuition and fees deduction form, and the IRA deduction worksheet. Those are all forms you're going to need to complete as a part of today's classwork assignment. And the assignment involves George Kelly, who is a high school teacher, and his wife Darla, who is a homemaker. They live in Boise, Idaho, and are filing jointly. On September 2011, George and Darla moved from Seattle to Boise in an employer-required move. George and Darla drove their car to their new home, and George's employer reimbursed 75% of his allowable moving expenses. And the moving expenses were as follows. House hunting, 300 Cost of moving household goods, 2000 Cost of disconnecting utilities, $50. The distance from the Seattle home to the Boise home was 501 miles. And the distance from the Seattle home to the work location in Seattle was 20 miles. The distance from the Seattle home to the Boise job is 515 miles. This information is provided, of course, for completing Form 3903. Darla did not work, and during the year, Darla received U.S. savings bond interest in the amount of $700 and Port of Seattle bond interest in the amount of $800. The Kellys will each contribute $5,000 to their IRAs. George's IRA basis for 2010 was $4,000. His IRA's value on 1231 of 11 was $9,000. Darla has no IRA basis in her account. George spent $400 on classroom supplies and paid $800 for continuing education at SCC during the year. He also paid $600 of student loan interest. Darla also paid $2,000 of qualified student loan interest. George will designate $3 to the presidential election campaign, and Darla will not go ahead and prepare their return. We've got a 1098E showing the student loan interest that was received by the lender from George Kelly. We have a 1098T showing $800 was paid by George Kelly for uh, tuition and fees. 
We have a W-2 from the Board of Education in the amount of $98,000. And let's talk a little bit about what's going on with their tax return. Clearly, they're going to need to complete Form 3903 to figure the deductible portion of their moving expenses, and your job is to determine what is allowed, what is not. And then, of course, when you, once you've determined what is allowed, you need to figure out how much reimbursement they would have received on that allowable amount, and their deduction will be reduced by the amount of reimbursement that they received. We have U.S. savings bond interest of $700, Port of Seattle bond interest of $800. Those amounts will go on line 8 a and line 8B of their 1040. The Kellys will each contribute 5000 to their IRAs, so you're going to have to figure out how much is deductible by completing the appropriate 8606 forms. We have classroom supplies paid for by George. How much can he claim as an adjustment to income on his return? How much student loan interest can they deduct? And how much tuition and fees deduction can they claim? Have fun with their tax return. At this point, it's time to push pause on video playback. Complete classwork assignment number seven for session three. When you are ready, resume video playback for a review of the answer key. And I have on the screen in front of you now the answer key for the Classwork 3 assignment for Session 7. Let's take a look at the brief outline that it provides. Firstly, the allowable moving expenses for the Kellys include moving of the household goods at $2,000, disconnecting the utilities $50, and mileage of 501 miles multiplied by 23.5 cents a mile. So we get 23.5 cents times 501, and we get $118. We add these three numbers up, and we have total allowable moving expense of $2,168. Now we know that the employer reimbursed 75% of that amount, so we're going to multiply that total by 75% and we get 1626. This is the amount that George was reimbursed. That means the difference of 542 is the amount he will be allowed to claim as a deduction on Form 1040, line 26. And of course he needs to make some entries on Form 3903 for that. And here is 3903. We start on line 1 by entering the transportation and storage expense. And on this line, we entered the cost of packing the household goods and disconnecting the utilities. That was $2,050. Then we have a travel expense, and that was $0.23.5 for the 501 miles, and that totals $118. We add those numbers up. We subtract out the portion that was a reimbursement from the employer, and we are left with the deduction, $542 and $542 is then entered on line 26 of the Form 1040. Next in line, we have the uh, IRA deduction and all of the other deductions that the Kellys are claiming. So let's just take a look at the 1040 and go through those. So we, of course, have George and Darla filing a joint return. They had wage income of $98,000. They had U.S. bond interest in the amount of $700 and tax-exempt Seattle interest in the amount of $800. That gives them total income on line 22 of $98,700. George paid $400 for educator expenses, but his deduction for educator expenses is limited to $250 for the year, so we enter $250 on line 23. And there again is the moving expense deduction. Next up, we have to figure out the amount of the IRA deduction that the Kellys are allowed to claim. So let's go do the IRA deduction worksheet for line 32. On the worksheet, we start by entering George and Darla. George is the primary taxpayer. His name is listed first here. So we're going to enter his information in column 1 uh, A and her information beginning in column 1 B. The first question in line is, uh, find your filing status, and if you are married filing jointly, enter 110 in both columns. But if you checked no on either line 1A or 1B, enter 179,000 for the person who was not covered by a plan. The person not covered by a plan is Darla, so she will enter 179. George is covered by a plan, so he enters 110,000. Next, we enter the amount from Form 1040, line 22. And we can see that line 22 is showing $98,700. And next it says, enter the total of the amounts from Form 1040 lines 23 through 31A, plus any write-in adjustments you entered on the dotted line next to line 36. Well, the two adjustment items that are included in those lines are the educator expense deduction and the moving expense deduction. We add those two numbers together and we get $792, and we enter that on line 4. We are allowed to reduce the Kelly's income by $792, 
and the total of 98,700 minus 792 is 97,908, and so that is the amount that we enter on both lines 5A and 5B. Next step, let's take a look here in the five print at the bottom of the worksheet. If married filing jointly or qualifying widow and the result is $20,000 or more or $10,000 or more in the column for the IRA of the person who was not covered by a retirement plan, enter the applicable amount below on line 7 for that column and then go to line 8. Well, the amount to enter for Darla will be $5,000 because she was under age 50 at the end of the year. Let's go on to line 7. And here we have line 7. Line 7 instructions say take George's amount from line 6 and multiply that by 25%. You will see it's right here in the fine print. Married filing jointly or qualifying widow, multiply by 25%. Well, when I do that, I get $3,023, but the instructions say round up to the nearest $10, and when I do that, I get $3,030. Darla sticks with $5,000, and uh, the next step is to see how much wage income that they had. They're not allowed to make a contribution that exceeds the wage income or the compensation for the year. Their compensation is more than adequate. So ultimately, the limits for these couple are as follows. We look at the maximum amount that George is allowed to contribute, $5,000, and assume that he is contributing all of that. He is going to be limited, though, in the amount of his deduction. His deduction cannot exceed 3,030. And what that means is if we take 5,000 minus 3,030, we're left with $1,970. That is going to be the starting point for George's Form 8606. Darla's contribution is not limited, it's allowed in full, and so the total amount to enter on line 32 of Form 1040 is going to be 3,030 plus $5,000 and there is the total, $8,030. The next item in line is the student loan interest deduction. Even though the total amount of student loan interest paid for the year was greater than $2,500, the IRS limits the deduction to $2,500. So we enter $2,500 on line 33. And then, of course, George also had a tuition and fees expense, and for that, we're going to need to complete 8917. Here is George's Form 8606, and the starting point is that $1,970 amount that we just showed you at the bottom of the Line 32 worksheet. We then enter his basis from earlier years, and how do we know what that basis is? We told you in the wording of the problem right here. The Kellys will each contribute 5000 to their IRAs, and George's basis was 4 So we enter 4 on line 2. We add line 1 and line 2 together, and we get George's new basis for the year, $5,970. The value of his IRAs at the end of the year was $9,000, and we also gave you that information in the wording of the problem. It's simply so you can complete the form in full. Next, we have the moving expense form, and then on to the tuition and fees deduction form. The purpose of this form is really to identify which student the qualifying expense was paid for. The student is George Kelly. The amount of qualifying expense he has is $800. The next thing we look to is whether or not his income is going to limit the amount of his deduction, and the rest of this worksheet is used for that purpose. And what happens is if the income goes over the amount shown for their filing status, and in this case, 160000 for a married filing joint couple, then they're not allowed to claim a deduction. But their income is clearly less than 130000 so their deduction is allowed in full, and $800 will be entered on the Form 1040 on line 34. We now add up all of the income and all of the adjustments for the year. The income is 98700 The adjustments total 12122 That gives adjusted gross income to the Kellys of $86,578. And moving on to page 2 of the Kellys tax return, we begin at the top of page 2 with 86,578 their adjusted gross income their standard deduction for married filing joint when no one is age 65 or older is $11,600 they enter their personal exemption amount of 7400 and their taxable income is $67,578 the tax tables say their tax is $9,286, but they only had $7,500 withheld, so ultimately they owe $1,786. That concludes the review of George and Darla Kelly's tax return. Let's return now to the student manual to review the homework assignment for Session 7. 
There are two homework assignments associated with Session 7. Homework Assignment A is a fairly straightforward uh, assignment. You will find it on page 46 of the Student Manual. And it says that for questions 1 through 4, determine the maximum allowable contribution each of the following people can make to their child's Coverdell Education Savings Account. So again, in this problem, you're going to be looking at phase outs and how much each of these individuals can contribute based on their income. Homework problem B is a little bit more effort. It involves preparation of a tax return for Leia and Han Solo. They are, will require a Form 1040, an 8889, and 8606, the IRA deduction worksheet for Line 32, as well as a Roth worksheet, so you'll keep yourself busy with this one. Let's take a look. Leia is a nurse born in 1967, and she lives with her husband, Han, who is an airline pilot. Hans employer paid all of their moving expenses for them, and they reside at 6060 Millennium Drive. Their daughter, Alexandra, lived with them all year. Hans contributed $2,500 to his qualified family coverage HSA for the year. His annual HSA deductible is $5,000, and during the year he withdrew $2,000 to pay for unreimbursed qualified medical expenses. Leah and Han want to make the maximum deductible IRA contributions that they can and then contribute the balance to their Roth accounts. They have not made any contributions that are non-deductible in earlier years. During the year, Leah paid $1,500 of student loan interest and also received $12,000 of unemployment. Each of the solos wish to contribute $3 to the presidential election campaign. Their W-2s and 1099-R are attached. Prepare their federal tax return and then answer the questions. So we have a W-2 here from ABC Hospital for Leah. Han has a W-2 from Happy Airlines. We can also see here that Han ha took a distribution from his pension plan during the year. The distribution code is 1. So that concludes Session 7 of the Basic Tax Course. It is now time to complete your reading and homework assignments for Session 7, and I will see you next time in Session 8. And of course, we will begin Session 8 with a review of the Session 6 quiz, and then we will move on to a review of the Session 7 homework assignment. I'll see you then, and bye-bye.